My name is Bill Hayton and I'm the editor of Asian Affairs, which is the journal of the Royal Society for Asian Affairs, which is uh, hosting today's event. Um, I hope that the presentations uh, from this discussion uh, will develop into articles that we'll publish in the journal uh, in due course. It's a really uh, timely topic, talking about Taiwan and Korea and their southbound policies at the moment at a time when there's been a fair degree of attention to Taiwan uh, in the last couple of months, it's fair to say, um, and a sort of more recent, uh, a sort of longer term concern about uh, how countries are going to balance their relations with China, with their relations with other parts of Asia. Uh, and I suppose what Taiwan and, and South Korea have been doing in trying to develop their southbound policies uh, has a lot of lessons uh, for other countries as they try to balance their diplomatic and trading relations uh, with East Asia. The idea for this event was originally proposed by uh, Dr. Ying Kit Chen, um, research fellow at Leiden University, uh, and has been brought to fruition by uh, Dr. Chi Leung Lee, Carl, from the Institute of China Studies at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. Um, we have a really international selection of speakers with presentations coming from Malaysia, from Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and India. So I'd like to hand over to Carl uh, to introduce the speakers, and then we'll begin the first session. So over to you, Carl. Thanks so much indeed for all your help in organizing this event. Thanks a lot, Bill. Ah, good morning there to everyone, or, or to good afternoon for, to anyone around the world. So. Okay, uh, first of all, my uh, sincere uh, thanks to Bill for uh, allowing us to have this uh, contribution to Asian affairs as a special issue. So we have a, a panel of, uh, we have one whole panel here from uh, Taiwan, from India, from Malaysia, and South Korea, of course. Uh, uh, okay, let's, let me introduce some of it. Uh, let me introduce uh, one by one. Okay, we, we uh, our whole panel will be uh, we'll start first with uh, uh, Professor Alan uh, Yang from uh, uh, Taiwan Asia Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation the TAF. Okay, so uh, Professor Yang is the ex executive director of uh, TAF, and then uh, we'll continue with this. Uh, uh, Professor Yang will be talking about uh, comparative uh, uh, studies in between. Uh, Korea uh, new southern policy and Taiwan's new southbound policy. So after uh, Professor Yang, we will be uh, joined by uh, Miss Sarah. Uh, she's from Blue Bank and she'll be talking about uh, Korea's uh, new southern policy, uh, NSP and NSP plus maybe. Yeah, and then from there on, uh, we'll start with the uh, Korea uh, side of the uh, not new south new southern policy uh with uh, dr nuliana and mr aaron uh mr aaron from uh, uh from hiroshima university and dr nuliana is my colleague here in university of malaya so they will be talking about the southeast asian responses to korea's nsp uh, while uh dr georgian john from mahatma gandhi university if i'm not wrong so he will be talking about india's responses to uh korea's ssp so after we having a, after the session on Korea, perhaps we may have this uh, a short uh, discussions, Bill, or okay, short discussions, yeah, uh, session, and then uh, I will start mine with the for the Taiwan side on. Uh, so I'll be presenting on Taiwan's uh, new Japan policy, and my colleague from the same institute. Uh, uh, Dr. Shahada will present uh, the, the South Asian responses, Southeast Asian responses to the NSP, but uh, she will be, uh, because of some uh, uh, timetable uh, uh, difficulty uh, earlier, so I, I put her in the last. So uh, instead, my other friend from uh, Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, Dr. Sana, Hasmi will be presenting uh, the Indian responses to uh, the Taiwan's NSP, new sub new sub policy. Uh, and then after that, uh, Dr. Shahada will wrap up the whole thing with the Southeast Asian responses to uh, uh, Taiwan's NSP. Uh, perhaps we will have another 15 minutes or 
for 10 minutes for discussion about that on Taiwan's and NSP. Okay, so basically that's my introduction. Uh, yeah, I think. Great, thank you very much indeed. So shall we go straight into the, the first session, comparing uh, South Korea and, and Taiwan's new South Pound policies. And I'd like to invite uh, Alan, Professor Yang, uh, to begin. Okay, thank you, Bill. <clears throat> uh, I would like to share uh, my slide. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, my colleague. And my name is Alan Yang. Uh, I'm currently the Distinguished Professor at the National Zhengzi University, and also the Executive Director of the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation. And on behalf of my mentor and also my co-author, Professor Xin Huang Michael Xiao, I will present our joint effort in this uh, uh, article entitled, Navigating the Politics of Soft Power, Taiwan's and Korea's Regional Approach in Comparison. And my special thank goes to uh, Dr. Uh, Carl Lee for the kind invitation to to me, to us, to join this very meaningful project. And also special appreciation to, to Bill and also to uh, the Royal Society for Asian Affairs for, for organizing such a meaningful webinar and also the workshop. I do look forward to the intellectual brainstorming and exchange later. Uh, due to the time constraint, I only have a uh, 15 minutes, so I will try to be very brief and quick. Uh, uh, with this uh, presentation, uh, I would like to address on some key takeaway. The first one is the soft power matters. What is the concept, progress, and variant of the soft power? And then I will proceed to sp some feature on uh, the new Southern policy of Korea and also the new Southbound policy of Taiwan comparing with their uh, specific features. For example, the NSPK target at three Ps and the NS NSPT uh, address on the importance of public diplomacy plus warm power practice. And finally, I will try to wrap up by uh, reviewing the contending features of these two new Southbound policy and two uh, new Southern policy and then add a very quick conclude, concluding remark. And uh, next, uh, uh, can everyone see my next slide? Okay. Uh, my main argument Just put it into the, is- into the presentation mode, Alan, maybe. Okay. Uh, the, the, the geopolitics matters. We know that uh, the current current situation of the Indo-Pacific major power project its influence in Southeast Asia, including United States, Japan, China, and India. And apart from this uh, major power, we do find that there are increasing number of the middle power engagement, for example, Taiwan and South, and South Korea, since the 1990s, try to link up with the regional community, that is the ASEAN. And since 2016, Taiwan has enhanced our relationship with Southeast Asian country, South Asian country and New Zealand and Australia in terms of the practice of the new Southbound policy. And a year after that, Korea promoted its new Southern policy in 2017 and focused more on concentrate on ASEAN and ASEAN community. And this important, this important two southward effort have been very distinctive and shared some common features. And I think this is the overall background information that I would like to argue and also discuss through our joint effort. And the common feature of these two NSP related to the people-centered engagement and the practice of the soft power, that is the soft power resources sharing. However, we uh, uh, scrutinize the 
IR literature and find that not many IR literature specifically compare these two policy. In order to highlight how uh, the middle power such as Taiwan and Korea can strengthen their roles and engagement in the regional integration process, especially in crafting the new regional economic framework at the present. Uh, our paper will compare the two NSPs. And also in addition to that, uh, we would like to provide some new ideas and also framework for the uh, intellectual element of the warm power comparing with the new power, the, the soft power. Taiwan's declared warm power and uh, its practice is very important. It's a very important feature when we discuss uh, the public diplomacy as well as the soft power uh, mechanism. And our article will be divided into five parts, including the conceptual evolution of the soft power and the new policy practice in Asia. And the second part will discuss the transformation and strengthening from soft power to warm power. And the third one will introduce the case study of so South Korea's new, so new South Southern policy through the lens of the soft power. And the fourth one will focus on Taiwan's case. And then conclusion will wrap up the comparative studies. Alan, soft can power you move your is, slides yes. on? Because we're, we are only seeing your title slide at the moment. Okay, okay. I, I think maybe uh, I need to... Uh... So is it clear? Yeah, if you could go into presentation mode, that would be a bit better, but that. Okay. Uh, uh, we all know that from the uh, theoretical literature, soft <clears throat> power connotes the attraction and persuasion through the utilization of the cultural, social attraction or other soft power resources to achieve the desired outcome of a specific agent or country. However, uh, it's, it's around more than two decades. There have been some internal transformation from within and that drives the soft power practice to more interactive warm power practice. And that is the Taiwan's uh, articulation of the soft power. In the detailed definition of Taiwan's practice, uh, we argue that the warm power practice uh, is aiming at share the warmth to the partner in need. And the second feature is to keep the agent or the country central and indispensable in the everyday life of our partners. With that, uh, we do advocate that more case study and practice are in demand. And uh, this is the uh, the picture that I collect from uh, Korean President Moon and also it's uh, his, his presence at the ASEAN uh, Korea Summit. And for, for Seoul's uh, New Southern Policy, it, is, it was advocated by President Moon since 2017. And the idea is to navigate through the geopolitics in terms of the US-China confrontation on South issue in South Korea, in Korea, and promote the uh, international collaboration for securing Korea's national interest. But it is also interesting to show that not only the new Southbound, new Southern policy K, but the new Southern uh, Northern policy as the strategic hedging of the Moon administration and the purpose is to secure a more balanced diplomacy. And we find that through the fact collect, collection process, the new Southern policy is mainly in the presidential diplomacy, echoing to, although it is echoed to the people-centered ASEAN community building agenda. Uh, it mostly focuses on the three P target. The first P is the people, that is the ASEAN Social Cultural Community, the ASCC. The second P is the prosperity, that is the ASEAN Economic Community. 
And the final C is also related to the original strategic hedging orientation. That is the peace, the ASEAN security community. And we do find that uh, through the whole process implementation and Korean government has set up an institutional mechanism. That is the presidential committee on the new Southern policy that gather 14 different ministry and also include 30 deputy minister level senior official to do brainstorming and oversee the implementation of this specific policy. And one thing that uh, Korea is very uh, unique in promoting this bilateral and regional tie is to base upon its original existing formal tie. That is the uh, Korea ASEAN summit and also the anniversary uh, platform of the dialogue partnership between, uh, between Korea and also ASEAN. So through this uh, very brief introduction, we know that it is more multilateral and also uh, work out through the president's visit. When uh, President Moon visited ASEAN and to attend the ASEAN related summit and also meeting, he will advocate how Korea's economic uh, performance and influence will contribute to the ASEAN community building and also to promote the increase, increasing the trade volume and also the investment amount. And with his personal charisma and also his leading effort in enabling the new Southern policy during the past years in his administration, Korea become a key word in the ASEAN uh, related summit and meetings. And later, when we find, uh, when we look at Taiwan's case, that shows a totally different configuration. And this is President Tsai Ing-wen in the Yushan Forum, the signature uh, foreign policy uh, platform for Taiwan's new Southbound policy. And my foundation, Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, took the pleasure and honor to organize this annual Yushan Forum and to advocate Taiwan's voice in partnership with our neighboring country in ASEAN, in South Asia, as well as in New Zealand and Australia. And I'm also delighted to learn that my colleague, Dr. Sana Hashmi from TAF also joined this session, this panel as well. And Taiwan's new Southbound policy, we will call that NSPT, has been advocated by President Tsai Ing-wen since 2016 one year earlier than President Moon's uh, new Southern policy. And the purpose is to navigate through, also through the geopolitics, moving beyond the Taiwan-China dilemma and reorient Taiwan's diplomacy. Uh, President Tsai called that a uh, steadfast diplomacy. And the idea is to seek the multifaceted collaboration with regional community through the people-to-people -people exchange and I would like to highlight that Taiwan did not enjoy any diplomatic tie with the ASEAN 10 country uh, and also the South Asian country as well as New Zealand and Australia. So we cannot follow uh, like uh, President Moon's attendance and presence at every ASEAN uh, summit. So instead, Taiwanese president and public sector and also the administration try to utilize the public diplomacy and strengthen the people to people exchange and also enhance the multifaceted connectivity with the neighboring region, regional country, as well as at the bilateral uh, level. And one specific feature uh, that Taiwan is different from Korea is there has been a million new residents from Southeast Asia living in Taiwan, including the transnational marriage spouse. Most of them are female and the children of the transnational marriage family. And they are, uh, they are around 70, 700,000 migrant worker 
from Southeast Asian countries such as Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand uh, living in Taiwan and become the very important economic helper of Taiwanese industry and business. And during the past years, there has been increasing number of the students studying in Taiwan from Southeast Asia. And although uh, the South Korea, the Korean government target at the 3P uh, uh, blueprint, working with three different uh, community pillar, regional community pillar, Taiwanese government and also our uh, administration focus on the implementation of the five flagship program on economic and industry connectivity, education and talent training, public health and medical cooperation and regional agriculture. Finally, it tried to promote the bidirectional social exchange and connectivity. Similar to Korea, uh, we do have established the institutional mechanism, including in the very beginning, the new Southbound policies concept comes from the president herself and also a special task force in presidential office. And currently, uh, it is implemented by the all and coordinated by the Office of the Trade Negotiation, including the five ministry in charge of the above mentioned flagship program, and in partnership with the NGO and think tank that is my foundation, Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, working with the civil society organization. <clears throat> And a unique feature is to implement the new Southbound policy through the practice of the cross-sectoral partnership, the PPPP. And <coughs> through this bi-directional exchange, Taiwan has been successfully enhanced and restored the social tie through the multifaceted partnership with our neighboring country. Alan, could this you is about two more minutes. Yes, yes. Uh, let me uh, briefly share with you. This is the geographic setting of the new Southbound policy. And those policy and flagship program echo to United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. And I will also like to share with you uh, this slide later. Uh, the cross-sectoral <coughs> partnership referred to the public sector private sector and people sector. And this is quite uh, unique comparing with uh, the South Korean's case. And as mentioned, the government led flagship program, including the, uh, bilateral investment agreement and also the trade facilitation process. And not only the bilateral uh, agreement, but we try to expand expand more regional ties through the FTA with uh, Canada, the like-minded country, New Zealand and Australia, the new Southbound policy uh, partner country. And specifically uh, regarding the talent cultivation, uh, out of Taiwan's uh, 98,000 foreign students studying in Taiwan's university in 2020, and more than 56 percent of them uh, from new Southbound policy partner country. So that has been an increasing uh, uh, number of the students from the neighboring country to study in Taiwan and also to conduct internship program in Taiwan. Another specific uh, program that I would like to highlight is the medical and public health we uh, utilize the one country, one center program to work with Indonesia, India, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, and other Southeast Asia country to jointly set up a medical center and then to facilitate the bilateral uh, medical commodity tie and also the training program among the medical staffs. And that has been successfully done and to expand into the one country multiple center program. Could you move to the conclusion, Alan? Thank you. Okay, okay. So I will quickly uh, jump into the conclusion. Uh, apart from this five flagship program, there have been already 13 government agencies working on this policy. 
comparing with the 14 ministry of the South Korea's case. And the final conclusion is the uh, comparative study. Uh, I list some highlights. The first one is strong leadership. Taiwan and Korea enjoy the strong leadership, the presidential uh, mandate in promoting these two policy. However, uh, uh, continuously, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen uh, has his, his, uh, her second term and is now fully committed in promoting the new Southbound policy while uh, President Moon uh, stepped down. And the second one is the ministry. There have been cross sectoral practice between uh, different, among different ministry, both Taiwan and Korea. If you see the T, the, 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 the yellow highlighted one means uh, uh, this country or this case is more uh, effective or more permanent. And a people-centered orientation for the case of Taiwan is more uh, uh, <coughs> clear. And for the regional community building process, Taiwan's case mobilized uh, the cross sectoral and also the bi-directional exchange that shows the significant achievement. <clears throat> and for the policy tool, since South Korea, Korea enjoyed a diplomatic tie with almost all the ASEAN countries. So they can clearly easily mobilize the policy tools to engage with the neighbor. And for the rest one, the final one is the think tank and NGO act as the driving forces. Uh, Taiwan's case is more uh, clear. So uh, I would like to stop here by quoting one important uh, articulation made by the former Prime Minister Tommy of Australia, Tony Abbott, he uh, addressed this keynote speech at the Yushan Forum, the new Southbound Policy Forum, saying that nothing is more pressing right now than solidarity with Taiwan if we want a better world. So I will stop here and thank you for your attention. And I do look forward to the further exchange and learn from you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. That was really, really useful. A really good introduction, I think, to what's been going on. I suppose my, my question would be, you, you, you pointed out the, the, the similarity in the dates when Taiwan and Korea began their southbound policies. Is there much evidence of learning between them? Are they borrowing ideas? Are there exchanges and discussions about how to go forward? Uh, should I uh, respond now? Yes, yeah, please, yeah. Yes, Bill, thank you for your wonderful question. Uh, 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 there is some uh, time differences between uh, the NSP uh, K and NSP uh, Thai T. And I do see that there have been some discussion among the university and think tank on learning from each other. Even I myself has been invited by Korea's uh, foreign ministry to address uh, some of the fighting of our new southbound policy was there. But I will say that happens at the grassroots uh, level and think tank level and university level. But there has been no clear learning mechanism or, me uh, or institution set up at the government's level. Okay, thank you. Um, do any of the other participants in, in the seminar have any questions for Alan? I think we have a question from the Q&A. Oh, yes, we do. Box, That's box right. so it's a question from Michael Ryu. Uh, dear Professor Yang, there are 400,000 Taiwanese nationals currently residing in mainland China, and a significant proportion of them are youth, 20 to 40 years old. Um, the Taiwanese youth employment dependence in China is higher than in, in South Korea. Uh, given the threat of military confrontation between China and Taiwan, what strategies would Taiwan undertake to create alternative employment so that to wean itself off from Chinese companies in the future? Well, this is a very uh, uh, good question at this critical moment. <clears throat> I think uh, currently, uh, there have been increasing number of the factory uh, and also Taiwanese business based in, based in China 
try to reorient and relocate their uh, network in Southeast Asia as well as in India. So that create increasing number of the opportunity for our young people uh, living in China to work in uh, other country and to diversify the political and security risk uh, between Taiwan and China. And in addition, uh, the new Southbound policy try to diversify the risk as well. And also we cannot uh, see the result overnight and that takes some time. And that is the reason why the government, the public sector try to uh, cultivate the institutional partnership. And then through the bi-directional exchange, we can invite more stakeholder from private sector, from NGO to join and also to invite more young people to take part in the process. Right, thank you very much indeed. Um, so I, I think you, you said you had to, you have to leave our session early. So shall we, shall we leave it there? And then we'll move on to our, our next speaker. Is that okay, Alan? Yeah, thank you, Great. my pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. That was a really good introduction, I think, to the two uh, countries uh, southbound policies. Um, can we move on now to, to Sarah, to Sarah Yun, um, uh, who's uh, uh, going to talk about uh, the evolution of, uh, of South Korea's uh, southbound pol southern policy uh, and the transition in the, in the recent government. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Alan, and we'll, we'll see you again. And now I'll move on to, to Sarah. Uh, so good morning, good evening, and good afternoon for all of you joining from across different time zones. Uh, my name is Sarah Yoon, um, as kindly introduced by Carl, and I'm a consultant at the World Bank currently located in Seoul, South Korea. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here today for this opportunity to present about this really exciting and burgeoning topic at the conference, um, as Professor Yang has kindly um, presented. And I'll be presenting on behalf of my co-author as well, Dr. Jan Gallis, on the topic of the evolution of South Korea's new Southern policy, or the NSPK, transitioning from moon to yin. So um, I would like to first start off this presentation with just a brief overview of the NSP and the motivation that drove this research topic. So in brief, as Professor Alan Yang has already explained in depth during the uh, presentation earlier, NSP for Korea was announced and established in 2017 under the Moon Administration to deepen Korea's strategic partnership with ASEAN and India and form under the vision of achieving a people-centered community of peace and prosperity, this NSP was particularly notable in the sense that it served as a first major initiative of Korea in Southeast and South Asia under a single framework. And although we would say that it's much broader and wide encompassing, the general aims and objectives of the NSP under the Moon administration can be summarized as the follows. Uh, it sought to advance a unified initiative with ASEAN and India, to elevate South Korea's relations with ASEAN and India to the level of its four traditional and major diplomatic partners, namely the US, China, Russia, and Japan, and to diversify Korea's strategic focus to pursue a more balanced foreign diplomacy, especially in the context of the external geopolitical factors. And this was something that was well explained by Professor um, Yang as well. And the NSP in this sense at the time reflected South Korea's earlier intention to try to avoid an outright alignment with the US US or an outright alignment against China in the interest of maintaining the vibrant relationship with China as its biggest trading partner, but also in the interest of trying to be able to leverage China as a facilitator of denuclearizing or assuaging the nuclear threats of North Korea. But this signature policy of Moon actually recently faced a turn of events as a South Korean presidential election in 2022 resulted in the victory of Yoon and a shift in administration from the Democratic Party of Moon to the People Party People Power Party of Yoon occurred. And accordingly, like Professor Yang mentioned, Moon, who has been the initiator and champion of the NSPK, has now stepped down in May 2022. And as many other democracies, South Korea also has a history of rebranding and reforming its existing policies following shifts in administrations. And Yoon, during his election campaign, also on multiple occasions emphasized that there would be a specific and boosted focus on security cooperation with ASEAN, especially given the external context that I've mentioned earlier, such as the intensifying US-China rivalry within the Indo-Pacific region and the growing and multiplying North Korean nuclear threats, despite the balanced diplomacy tactic that has been tried during Moon's administration. So against that backdrop, 
there have been many questions and growing speculations from both within and outside of Korea surrounding the continuity or the recalibration of Moon's NSP and whether it'll carry on its legacy into the UN administration. And I think Professor Yang has um, kindly pointed out on this um, area as well. So having discussed the background and motivation, now let's have a quick look at the NSP under the Moon administration. Uh, the NSP under Moon, as mentioned, has focused on three pillars or the three Ps, such as people, prosperity, and uh, peace. I'm going to skip going into the details of this initiative as it was already um, flashed out by uh, Professor Yan. And this table only briefly outlines the major initi initiatives under each pillar and some of the more measurable achievements of this policy. So for example, under the people pillar, especially following the pandemic, South Korea and ASEAN have successfully cooperated for public health under the ASEAN Response Fund, COVID-19 Comprehensive Response Program, and enhancing the detection capacity for COVID-19 in ASEAN countries, which has totaled to almost 30 million in US dollars in funding. And under the prosperity pillar, you can see here on the simple graphics presented on the right, that the trade volume between ASEAN and South Korea had actually increased by more than 20% since the launch of the NSP, while Korea's investments to India increased by almost sevenfold between 2018 and 2020. But an area where I would like to draw your attention to is under the pillar of peace, because the general evaluation of Moon's NSP on this peace front has been that its strength is precisely a source of its weakness as well. And this is in the sense that although the circumvention of security or political issues of sensitive nature has enabled Korea to expand its economic and cultural cooperation with ASEAN, at the same time, it had also limited Korea's ability to address regional security concerns through the NSP. And this was also the area where the most significant transition in policy was foreseen to take place as the transition occurred from Moon to Yoon. And to that context, at the ASEAN summit held in Cambodia on November 11, which is just four days ago, Yoon administration finally revealed what it now calls the Korea's independent Indo-Pacific strategy based on the three visions of freedom, peace, and prosperity, and a core component of which includes an ASEAN-specific plan within the strategy called the Korean ASEAN Solidarity Initiative. So when we have a quick look at the introduced agendas during the ASEAN summit, you can see that some of its main elements resemble the initiatives under Moon's NSP, such as the increase in ASEAN Korean Cooperation Fund and Korean Mekong um, Cooperation Fund, as well as the upgrading of the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement to include industries and sectors or commodities where Korea is competent at and faces a high demand coming from the ASEAN countries and markets. But you can also see here that some elements demonstrate a clear divergence, which I've highlighted in red. Notably, the regularization of the ASEAN Korea Defense Minister's meeting and the expression of Korea's intent to proactively take part in joint military exercises with ASEAN and utilizing the security cooperation as a basis for ASEAN Korea comprehensive strategic partnership to be achieved by 2024. So in sum, what we see here from this transition is that while maintaining the basic framework of NSP and the components of peace and prosperity pillars, the UN administration has more ambitiously expanded its focus on security beyond only economic and cultural cooperation, which is a focus area for Moon. And this is widely seen as a very clear transition from the strategic ambiguity of Moon's NSPK that was understood to have purposefully excluded sensitive political and security issues. So to dive in and zoom in a little bit further, in addition to the aforementioned clarity in trying to emphasize security cooperation with ASEAN and India, there are also more notable divergences at the larger and conceptual level of the strategy. And you can look at it from the second bullet point on the slide. So this new Indo-Pacific strategy has made it very apparent of Korea's closer alignment with the US security agenda and the US's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy or the FOIP strategy. That is, the strategic, the strategic concept of Korea's newly announced strategy is now being largely understood as aiming to more prominently contribute Sarah, to- So yeah. we, we lost your voice there for a second, but you're back. Okay, great. Uh, which which was the last word you heard me with? Uh, alignment with the U.S. 
All right, cool. So, um, so it's become very apparent that Korea's closer alignment with the U.S. security agenda and is free and open in the Pacific strategy. So that is to say that the strategic concept of Korea's newly announced strategy is now being largely understood as aiming to more prom prominently contribute to containing and counterbalancing China's growing influence in the region. In fact, you can also see here that the regional scope of the strategy itself, the Indo-Pacific region, is different from the Moon's administration that hesitated from establishing a regional st strategy directly referring to the Indo-Pacific region to prevent itself from being embroiled into the Sino-American tensions. And we think that this is further hinted through specific phrases and choices of words from Yoon's speech that was delivered at the ASEAN summit. Some examples, which I've highlighted in red here, say, a unilateral change of the status quo by force should never be tolerated, where it also says rules-based international order and protecting open and fair economic order. And these are phrases and choices of words that have also been repeatedly used by the US's Indo-Pacific strategy as well. So to that end, this can also be understood as a divergence from the Moon administration that initially sought to distance from both the US's Indo-Pacific strategy and China's Belt and Road Initiative, and rather try to support for the possibility of synergy from both countries. And thirdly, under Yoon, we would also say that the check and balance mechanism against China in the Indo-Pacific region appears to have become more direct. For example, previously, the Moon administration intended to transform the ASEAN into a partner for Korea's peace process and to transform it into a market for Korean products that would rival China, thereby opting for a more indirect method of counterchecking against China. And this contrasts quite strikingly against Yoon administration's um, mechanism under the Indo-Pacific strategy that's being largely understood as opting into a more direct approach of repositioning Korea as a supplementary force to try to ease the America's military burden in the region. So now the next question of due attention and interest is, what are the implications of this policy transition from Moon to Yoon? And surely these implications can be offered from many different perspectives and involved stakeholders from that of ASEAN, India, Korea's four traditional diplomatic partners and whatnot. But to narrow down and better specify the scope of our research, we focus specifically on the implication to South Korea as a middle power amid the growing Sino-American tension. And we have summarized these implications in three folds. One is that this transition from strategic ambiguity to strategic solidarity of South Korea in one part clarify and clarifies and confirms South Korea's stance in the Sino-American tension and sending a stronger signal about the importance of U.S.-backed security in its consideration for regional order. And this is something that had previously been absent during the Moon administration's balanced diplomacy tactic. And we think that this has transpired from the growing understanding that balanced diplomacy has not really been sufficient in trying to confront the growing North Korean threat, as well as leveraging China as a facilitator for peace and denuclearization of North Korea has become uh, has proven to become very difficult. And this can be also implied from Yoon's speech at the ASEAN summit that emphasize and refer to North Korea's nuclear program as a direct and serious threat to the international community and requires the cooperation of ASEAN to counter against. And the second implication is that the clear and active inclusion of security related cooperation in the Indo-Pacific strategy can now, can now be expected to strengthen Korea's role as a middle power and strategic partner to ASEAN by enabling a more comprehensive partnership with ASEAN that had previously been limited to economic and cultural level cooperation. But here I also want to point out that this benefit may be limited or confined to countries within ASEAN that have a clear stance in favor of the US, while also resulting in a trade off of stronger partnership with ASEAN partners that have a clear preference for China. The third implication is that the Korea's upgrading of the ASEAN level cooperation through NSPK to that of the Indo-Pacific level through this Indo-Pacific strategy speaks well of the growing significance and the geopolitical profile of the Indo-Pacific region. And Korea's active incorporation of this region in its strategy also implies that there may be foreseeable benefits in trying to strengthen Korea's position and standpoint in this regional context. But recently, before the official Indo-Pacific strategy was rolled out, foreign officials of South Korea have pointed out that Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy is not intended to target at one specific country. 
So whether Korea's geopolitical alignment is actually similar to that of the US and Japan, or the degree to which it would be actually currently remains to be determined as a strategy further unfolds over time. About three minutes, Sarah. Yep, perfect. So based on the findings so far, I would like to conclude my presentation by sharing some suggestions for future areas of research, some of which I think would be well addressed by the presentations that follow mine. So one, we think it would be meaningful to assess the geopolitical implications of this policy transition from Moon to Yoon from the ASEAN perspective, perhaps with a focus on whether this transition will lead to added benefits or losses compared to the previous form of cooperation under Moon. Second, given that this Indo-Pacific strategy has been unveiled only less than a week ago, and South Korea's major diplomatic partners are only starting to express their voices about this move, we also think that it might be meaningful to explore how this policy transition ends up affecting the Sino-American tension in the Indo-Pacific region, especially its effect on existing security cooperative cooperation initiatives like the Quad, as well as its impact on Korea's traditional diplomatic partners and also North Korea. Third, lastly, we also think it might be valuable to extrapolate upon whether this policy transition is a unique and contained case in the Indo-Pacific context, or if it is likely to be reflected in Koreans' other foreign policies in other significant regions and the geopolitical calculi that lie behind Korea of these strategic uh, policy decisions. So that concludes the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll be very happy to engage in your feedback and questions, if any. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. That was really helpful. And uh, I hadn't really appreciated kind of how uh, the, the the southbound <laughs> policy had been kind of embedded in, in the heart of this, the Indo-Pacific, a kind of a, a new vision uh, for, for, the, for the new government's uh, foreign policy. We have a question in the chat already, as in the Q&A already, uh, also from Michael, who asked the previous question. Uh, I'll read the question. Um, under the UN administration, when you say that South Korea's geopolitical strategy will be a force that will alleviate the US burden, do you mean that South Korea will potentially participate in interventions in the South China Sea, but also equip ASEAN countries uh, that would participate in countering China with the military hardware uh, manufactured under the booming South Korean military industrial complex, he says. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the question. And I think it's wonderful and something that deserves to be answered over time. But as I did say during my presentation, you know, this rollout of the Indo-Pacific strategy by South Korea is only very recent, only four days ago, in which uh, public officials have uh, given out the full details of the strategy. I do think that it might be premature to be able to determine the degree of the military engagement that South Korea foresees in engaging with ASEAN. And I also think that um, it would definitely depend on how the Sino-American tensions right now, both in the Taiwan Strait and South China Sea, how these things um, unfold over time. But what I can tell you as of now, based off of the, based off of the details given by the National um, Security Advisor and Yoon himself during the ASEAN summit, is that they are looking into regularization of ministerial level defense meetings, as well as joint military exercises, which at, the, at this point in time do not, to me, appear as um, full-blown or very direct engagement of military intervention. But thank you very much for that question. Thank you. I, I don't know if it's possible to disentangle this, but uh, is it possible to offer some thoughts about how much of this is the UN administration's own view of what South Korea should do independently and how much is them being lobbied and, and pushed to do things by Washington and maybe also Japan? I don't know if that's a factor. Yeah, again, I think that's a great question. Um, and as um, some of the details by the Indo-Pacific strategy at the ASEAN summit uh, basically said that this is an independent, independently, um, independently drafted and independently established policy of South Korea. So in that sense, at least on the surficial level, they would, you know, deny any lobbying or policy effect coming from Washington. But I also at the same time cannot deny there would obviously be foreign policy level pressures coming from different ministers asking for the UN administration to side more with the US, especially given the Sino-American uh, tensions that are going on. So in that sense, um, as any diplomatic foreign policy goes, I would say um, there would be an engagement of some level of direct and also indirect pressures um, going on. 
And also another point that I might also add here is that the Indo-Pacific strategy is not something that is unique only to Japan, uh, the US, and now Korea. Many European countries have also established their own Indo-Pacific strategies, especially given uh, the growing geopolitical profile of um, the Indo-Pacific region, but not all Indo-Pacific strategy of these countries are in line with the US and Japan, especially in terms of the uh, level of military engagement or in the vision of trying to contain and counterbalance against China. So I think although the name may be closely aligned at the moment, and there would be questions surrounding to what extent this um, alignment is actually close, I think these questions would be better answered and addressed over time. But I think it's definitely an area of great speculation and exploration. Great. Another webinar, perhaps. Thanks very much indeed. Sure. Any okay. other uh, thoughts from the uh, other participants, or shall we move on? Thank you, Sarah. That was really, really, you know, kind of clear and uh, gave us a really good uh, overview, I think, of the of the changes. Uh, it was going to be one of my questions, and I think, <laughs> I think you answered them all really well. So that's great. Um, so we'll move on to the uh, the next uh, paper presentation, which was jointly written by uh, Noliana and Aaron. And I think, Aaron, you're going to sort of present for both of you, uh, and then I think the two of you will be available for questions afterwards. So it's a pleasure to uh, present uh, to be present here today um, to present our paper um, that I've co-authored uh, with Dr. Nuliana. Um, so our paper is titled um, NSP um, and the NSP Plus, um, Elevating South Korea's uh, Middle Power Presence Among ASEAN um, Member States. So, all right, so what are we looking to find out uh, from our paper is, first, we're basically looking at examining the concept of middle power, and in doing so, we sort of look at the previous initiatives undertaken by South Korea um, in Southeast Asia to advance its middle power strategy. Second, we analyze whether the NSP and the NSP Plus are successful tools in enhancing um, South Korea's um, middle power strategy um, and diplomacy in ASEAN. And finally, we argue that the NSP and the NSP Plus has elevated South Korea's middle power presence um, in ASEAN. So, um, all right. So um, this is um, the first part of the paper, which where we look at uh, middle power theory. Um, so we look at the um, definitions by Robertson and Dee Swenlander. Um, so, so Robertson finds, points out um, a number of definitions, uh, with the first being fun functional definitions whereby countries can be seen as a middle power based on their, on their functions. And next is capacity uh, or positional definition, uh, which we look at the statistical measures of economic and military strength um, to compare countries. And finally is the behavioral based definition, which is based on the country's own behavior and action um, that it acts as a middle power. Um, and then uh, with the Swedlander, um, he sort of agrees with Robertson on the whole capacity argument, uh, in addition to saying that it's also um, self-conception con self is also uh, has a, a role to play, as well as status, status or international recognition, as well as systematic um, impact of the state itself. Um, and finally, we look at Cooper and Paladar, um, where they distinguish three different waves of middle power action. The first being through formal organizations, the second being through high profile initiatives, and the third is designated special issue that would require um, attention on a needs base. Uh, and, all right, sorry, this was the structure of the paper. Um, so, sorry, just to mention that uh, we start with middle power theory, and then we move on to South Korea as a middle power. Um, and then South Korea's engagement with Southeast Asia before NSP. Um, and then we discuss about South Korea's engagement under the NSP and NSP plus. And then we look at, uh, this is where we analyze ASEAN's outlook on South Korea as a middle power in Southeast Asia. And then we look at FYP and the way forward. So I've already mentioned um, the part on the middle power theory. So I'll move on to South Korea as a middle power. Um, so as we, as I went through just now about Robertson and this Ryan Lander, where they talk about capacity. So how is this capacity sort of looked upon? So we look at South Korea's capacity as the 13th largest GDP, um, 
as well as the 33rd in terms of GDP per capita, as well as it being ranked six militarily. So that sort of demonstrates, um, that's where we think it sort of demonstrates South Korea's middle power role. And then it's the behavior where South Korea behaves um, as a middle power or aspires to behave as a middle power within the international system, um, how it does so. So it basically does so by organizing important initiatives such as hosting of the G20 summit, as well as the Seoul uh, nuclear summit. And then we also see South Korea um, self-conceptualizing. Well, it self-identifies um, as a middle power. Well, it's also not only self-identified, it's also recognized as a middle power too. Um, in terms of its functional role, so where does it roles, um, where does it functions, um, at least uh, before this was, it was definitely caught in between great powers uh, with having um, security interests with the United States, as well as economic interests uh, with China. And if we look at the functional definition itself, um, what was its function, at least in the global stage, is whereby um, its role in the UN, um, OECD, APEC, um, as well as ASEAN regionalism. Uh, so there is an overall consensus um, that um, South Korea is a middle power, um, and it's prevalent to many academic works in the last decade as well. But the question remains, um, of course, um, how successful has South Korea is as a middle power? And where can it, it influence be directed to maximize the benefit of its presence? Um, so not surprisingly, ASEAN um, has become one of the key regions um, of South Korean government's um, focus um, from Lee myung baks administration, later picked up during the Moon administration. Engagement with um, ASEAN was given importance to sort of elevate the region's um, Legion status alongside uh, South Korea's four most important diplomatic partners, as mentioned uh, by, by our uh, previous presenter as well. So next we look at um, South Korea's engagement with ASEAN. Uh, at least this was before the NSP. Um, and we sort of divided it into the three standard um, um, arguments where economy, social, cultural, and political security. So in economy, there has been evidence of South Korea's engagement with um, individual ASEAN member states, um, at least back in the 1960s with um, FDIs, and then bilateral trade agreements with ASEAN member states in the late 1980s um, and early 1990s. And then there was an increased um, FDIs um, between ASEAN and also South Korea. So uh, compare that with, in the 1980s, it was about um, USD 16.1 million to 2016, right? It was at 5.1 billion. Um, so that's the FDI. Then there's also uh, increased evidence of increased in trade um, with the volume tripling from year 2000 to 2016. 2016. Um, and then also the crucial um, ASEAN Korea FTA um, on goods, investment, and services signed um, in nine, 2006, seven, and nine, uh, respectively. Um, in terms of social cultural, um, there has been consistent increase in the contribution towards the ASEAN South Korea Cooperation Fund with an initial um, contribution of 1 million um, at the start of it uh, in 1991 to at, by 2012, it stood at, um, by 2010, it stood at 5 million per year. So in total up to 2012, uh, South Korea has contributed 57 million to this fund. Um, and of course, then we uh, got Hallyu, I mean, of course, the influence of Hallyu on young people. Um, it's not only young people, but as well as the general population in ASEAN itself. Um, and then the increased number of scholarships, um, various scholarships um, to study in South Korea. And of course, the increased number of tourists uh, visiting uh, both, uh, both South Korea and ASEAN, vice versa. Um, in the area of political security, uh, with the paper we talked about how ASEAN has been active in ASEAN-led um, mechanisms throughout the formation years, namely with the ARF, APT, the EAS, as well as the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. Um, and there was an enhancement um, of diplomatic in influence, at least during the Lee myung bak administration with the New Asia Initiative. Um, and at the end, there was an elevation uh, of South Korea's hierarchy within ASEAN. Um, from initially being a sectoral dialogue partner to um, comprehensive dialogue partner until comprehensive dialogue partner was in 2010. Um, 
so this slide is just to um, mention about how has it changed like uh, from um, South Korea's engagement during Lee myung bak and then, then during um, Park and his administration. So the hype of middle power was there during Lee myung baks administration um, from global Korea. And then he specifically sort of addressing Asia with the two new Asia initiative. Um, and the purpose was to, of course, enlarge um, ge geographical horizon of Korean diplomacy to all parts of Asia, including South Pacific. Um, and then during Park and he of course, there was still the intention of advancing its middle power strategy. Um, and then it was to her initiative was um, NAPSI. Um, but it didn't, again, have the edge, like how Moon was. Moon was, there was a direct um, policy towards ASEAN, uh, per se, uh, in comparison to Lee myung Bak and um, Park and Hei, where it was just Asia or North Asia. So it wasn't as specific enough um, during these two administrations. So then we move to the um, NSP, um, where um, we look at it to the three different pillars in the paper, uh, prosperity, people, and peace. So under prosperity, we address the close economic cooperation in the areas of trade, investment, support for small businesses um, and enterprises, um, as well as infrastructure connectivity, especially in the area of smart cities. Um, and without doubt, there was a surge, um, increase in trade and surge in um, FDIs um, to ASEAN member states. Um, there were developmental initiatives um, and cooperation to the ODA in the area of infrastructure projects, rural development, education initiatives, and a growing amount of public health program. And there was a clear increase in the number of ODAs that doubled um, from the 2010 figure to 2019 figure. Um, then we look at people. Um, of course, there was a surge in the number of tourists, uh, at least after 2017. So 18 and 19, there was a surge in the number of tourists. Um, large number of students. Um, at 2000, in 2009, 34 percent of, of the foreign students um, in South Korea were from ASEAN, uh, which means that 64,200 um, were from ASEAN out of the total 147,000. Um, and then there was the launch of the two new scholarships um, and two new scholarship programs and also educational program um, in um, 2020. And then in terms of the peace pillar, um, there was increased in the high level exchanges and diplomatic engagements. Uh, president Moon, of course, being the first um, South Korean president to visit all ASEAN 10 member states within two years in office. Uh, and then he elevating the relationship with um, Indonesia to special strategic partnership, as well as strategic partnership with Malaysia and Thailand. Um, and then there was the establishment of the Bureau of ASEAN um, and Southeast Asia Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, and the increased number of staffs um, in the South Korean mission in ASEAN. Um, so, so that's the new Southern policy. Um, in terms of the new Southern Policy Plus, uh, we have seen this uh, in our previous presenter as well. Um, the, the focus here was, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, great. Bill, okay. we lost okay. you for a bit. <laughs> oh, it was me that lost you. You lost me. I thought I lost you. Uh, can oh, you okay. say five, so, uh, five more minutes? Yep. Sure. So uh, the new Southern Policy Plus was uh, the focus is basically um, on health at the seven different niche areas um, that um, Moon sort of elevated, um, implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we, of course, we had uh, the uh, South Korea contributing USD 1 million to the ASEAN Response Fund uh, for COVID-19 in April 2020. And then there was an additional 5 million given to the fund in October 2021. Um, of course, um, during this time, uh, South Korea were known for their testing kits. Um, and there was also, again, a contribution of USD 5 million to improve detection capacity for COVID-19 uh, to ASEAN member states. Um, the NSP Plus also tried to establish permanent channels for healthcare communication uh, between Korea and ASEAN, uh, with Singapore sort of taking the lead uh, while they were trying to standardize um, an ASEAN Korean, ASEAN Korean, um, sorry, ASEAN Korean um, health cooperation. Um, the NSP Plus also interestingly sort of um, prioritized smart city uh, this time around because it was under the future city um, area, uh, which again, there was an opening up of ASEAN um, 
ASEAN uh, Smart City Cooperation Centers in Bangkok, Hanoi, and Jakarta in October 2020. Um, and there were also collaboration on essential travel uh, arrangements uh, between South Korea and um, ASEAN member states. So that's the Northern uh, New NSP Plus. So this is uh, where our analysis uh, sort of comes in. Um, we analyze the paper by looking at um, ASEAN's outlook on South Korea's middle power in Southeast Asia. Uh, for, for this purpose, we sort of took, um, we, we looked at um, Cooper and Palada, um, the three waves um, of uh, middle power action, with the first wave being engagements with formal organizations. So sort of we show how South Korea has showed commitment by improving bilateral engagements via multilateral and minilateral approaches, with some examples being uh, relation to defense cooperation with ASEAN countries, such as the signing of the MOUs on defense with countries such as Vietnam and Brunei in 2018, Philippines and Thailand in 2019, and Malaysia quite recently in 2020. Then we look at the second wave, uh, which is um, the high profile initiatives that had ex extreme visibility uh, with Moon's, Moon being the first, uh, as mentioned earlier, Moon being the first South Korean president to visit all 10 um, members, uh, ASEAN member, member states, uh, where he had 10 bilateral summits. Um, and that showed how important uh, South Korea had perceived um, ASEAN to be at that time. Um, in addition, there was also a specific engagement with the Mekong countries, Mekong sub-region, uh, with the first ever Mekong South Korea summit in 2019. Um, and then the relationship was upgraded to strategic partners in 2020. And finally, there is the third wave, which is on specific issues. Um, and this specific issues um, ranges from public healthcare infrastructure, supply chain, connectivity, um, and also smart city development, uh, which has been given quite a focus where this year uh, in 2021, there is supposed to be at least six joint research uh, development projects, R&D projects related to um, smart city um, that has been agreed upon um, by ASEAN member states and South Korea. So ASEAN's response has been largely positive with increased good uh, goodwill between South Korea and um, the Asian ASEAN member states. Um, so this is um, something that Sarah has uh, mentioned just now. Um, this was sort of like some that, something that we were predicting um, before um, the ASEAN summit. So the way forward is, um, so the whole NSP might be sort of, I mean, is to be subsumed in FOIP. Um, Yoon's administration would formulate and announce um, and has announced its uh, diplomatic and security strategy uh, for the Indo-Pacific uh, region. So NSP, we thought might be seen as unuseful in solving the North Korea uh, nuclear issue and two trade focus, which we sort of are half right, I think, um, with our prediction. Um, so we sort of um, think that it would likely return uh, to US prioritized agenda. Um, with stronger engagement with the Quad and increased emphasis on global power politics and alliances, and as well as the ABC strategy, um, advance human capital, build health security, connect culture, digitalize Asian infrastructure. And ASEAN is likely to continue engagement with South Korea, but lower engagements on defense. So by some, uh, by some distance. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much indeed. That was really good overview of what's been uh, going on there. Um, I think what I'd like, me like to do now is turn to uh, Dr. Jojin um, and, and get a perspective on the Indian angle of um, South Korea's New South Southern policy. Um, and then maybe we'll take questions and we can maybe do a sort of compare and contrast um, like that. Well, uh, this is the broad organizational presentation. So I'll give you a brief introduction. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, New Southern policy, um, the broader South Korean strategic and foreign policy outlook, uh, which I may not have to do uh, much uh, because the previous speakers have, particularly Sarah has um, uh, uh, focused it in detail. Uh, then I'll give a brief introduction or background of India Korea relations to put in put the NSP and India Korea relations in context. Then I will talk about uh, NSP and India Korea relations. Uh, uh, then I'll make some brief uh, conclusion. Um, 
um, well, uh, as uh, uh, the new Southern policy, um, it is it was South Korea's first dedicated foreign policy instrument to targeting India. For in that sense, it was um, a unique uh, uh, policy as far as India is concerned. Uh, the NSP brought um, a new narrative and the elevated expectation elevated expectation for India for relations. Uh, how would I, I would argue that it failed to maintain the initial moment that it created when it was announced in 2017 18. Um, well, the major, uh, I would argue that uh, uh, the, the pandemic and also the intensification of geopolitic, geopolitics in the Indo Pacific or in Asia Pacific um, emerged as a hindrance, but also oh, expectation and knowledge gap also emerged as a major uh, challenges to the relationship between India and Korea uh, in this period of new Southern policy. Um, before getting into the India-Korea relations, I, I thought it's, it's, it's important to contextualize uh, it's in the regional um, context uh, to understand the different aspects and nuances of India-Korea relations. Um, it seems to me that uh, uh, we are going through a regional order transition. Uh, in, in particular, uh, I think there are two important trends or factors that, that are sort of shaping the regional context, which in a way uh, we also see, uh, it also featured into a realignment of relationship in Asia Pacific or the Pacific. Um, uh, so what the, the one aspect is the geoeconomic um, the trend, which is, well, which, in sort of uh, driven by the changing division of labor and the new growth centers in the region, particularly the shifting, the new growth centers are shifting from, the economic growth centers are shifting from East Asia to Southeast Asia and South Asia and the Africa. This, it, it forces countries to realign the relationship that we used to see uh, in the last um, two decades or so. And the second trend is the geopolitical, which is which is reflective of the changing regional balance of power, the rise of China, the rise of the rest, and sort of the relative decline of the United States. And it is manifested through, through the US-China strategic rivalry. What we can see, it's also reflected in the heightened securitization of military space in Asia. Um, so what, in terms of thinking about uh, the regional order, what, the, the, the environment appears to be a highly risk, uh, high risk and high uncertain situation. So uh, in, in the broader sense, if you look at the, uh, most of the countries are rearranging or, or trying to relook their uh, relationship in the regional context. And what you see is most of the countries are moving in the direction of a uh, hedging strategy. And this is also um, applicable to the India and Korea. Um, let me move on to uh, the, new, uh, the new Southern policy, uh, the, uh, in the broader context of uh, the South Korean strategic and foreign policy outlook. Um, since uh, Sarah has uh, explained the various aspects of the, uh, of the Korean, uh, the new Southern policy, its origin, the motivations, uh, I will not dwell uh, on those aspects, but however, I thought it's important for me to highlight some of the features so that uh, I will be able to, um, to contextualize India-Korea relations in a particular um, framework. Um, well, I mean, if you were to prioritize President Moon Jae-in's policy, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, if you were to look at the prioritization of Moon Jae-in's foreign policy, I mean, you have the Korean Peninsula peace process first, then the diplomatic balancing, which is reflective of Korea's approach to balance its relationship between, in its uh, balance its relationship between the U.S. and China, and then there is this uh, the diversification approach. Uh, which is also linked to the diplomatic balancing, the diversify Korea's relationship, economic and diplomatic relationship, moving away from the great powers. And that's where Korea's attempt to elevate uh, India's, its relationship with India and ASEAN. But it's also important to recognize, along with new Southern policy, the Korea also introduced new Northern policy, uh, which also had a similar uh, motivation to diversify Korea's uh, economic and diplomatic relationship with countries which are not uh, not in the, the Eurasian subcontinent. But unfortunately, because of the lack of uh, pro progress in the Korean Peninsula peace process, the emphasis has been mostly uh, focused on New Southern policy. Um, well, if some aspects of New Southern policy 
as mentioned, it, it, was, it was an attempt to elevate Korea's relationship with ASEAN and India, but I would argue it was mostly ASEAN focused. Uh, um, um, and, and it was a primarily a bilateral approach. Uh, well, Korea was forced to adopt NSP as its regional approach when it was pressured to take a position on um, Indo-Pacific or Belt and Road Initiative or China-led uh, regional approach, a US-led uh, approach to, so in that sense, Korea uh, rebranded NSP uh, to some extent as a regional approach at a later stage. Um, uh, even though uh, the uh, previous speakers have uh, uh, mentioned about the three Ps, um, uh, prosperity, peace, and people. But how I would argue from an Indian perspective, it was uh, mostly an economic engagement, primarily an economic en engagement. Um, uh, well, if you were to look at uh, New Southern policy in terms of a strategic narrative, um, uh, well, I mean, it, it, in a sense that to try to uh, try to project Korea's identity as a regional or actor. So the, I think there are two aspects to it. One is uh, it tried to project Korea's image as a developmental and economic partner, having no political ambitions. That's uh, the context in which uh, uh, Professor Yang's presentations becomes very important because Korea was trying to project itself as a soft power country. I mean, it also has to be understood in the context, the, in its approach to particularly Asia, Korea was sort of competing with the Japanese and the Chinese in terms of capturing the Chinese, um, the these ASEAN markets, and also to uh, enhance its influence um, in the particularly in the ASEAN countries, and also uh, the elevation of or the rebranding of NSP as, as a, a regional approach, particularly in the post 2020 context. I'll come back to the particular uh, time frame uh, in the later half of my presentation. Um, uh, as, as tried to project itself as, as a regional, independent regional actor. I mean, it, it was part and parcel of, 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 of the, uh, the diplomatic balancing that the Korea was trying to do between United States uh, and, and, and China. And uh, what, I mean, this is uh, reflective in some sense in the Korea's ambiguous approach to Indo-Pacific and also its ambiguous approach to the China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, Let me talk a little bit about India-Korea relations to, to put the NSP and India-Korea relations, uh, to understand the NSP and India-Korea relations. Uh, as you know, uh, there was limited interaction between India and Korea during the Cold War period, uh, particularly because uh, uh, of the geopolitical uh, political aspects, uh, because Korea was deep into the US alliance system, uh, but uh, on the other hand, India was a non-aligned, uh, framed itself as a non-aligned country, and it sort of adopted what one could call the equidistance policy to balance relationship with North Korea and South Korea. Uh, but that change, um, particularly in the uh, in the aftermath of the Cold War, uh, enhanced its relationship uh, between South Korea, moving away from its uh, uh, equidistance policy of managing a sort of a similar approach to the North and the South. And, um, the, and, and, and in the initial period, I mean, this is also uh, India's approach to South Korea was part and parcel of its, its uh, look east policy, which, um, uh, which uh, from an Indian perspective uh, was an attempt to enhance its relationship with countries uh, on the Eastern port, particularly ASEAN countries, as well as Japan and Korea. Um, and uh, uh, the relationship was, uh, was, was, was labeled as a long-term strategic, a long-term co cooperative partnership for peace and prosperity in 2004 and strategic partnership in 2010. And this, uh, this is an important point uh, of, 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 of the india korea relations. Um, uh, and also it was redefined as a special strategic partnership in 2015 uh, during Prime Minister Modi's visit to Korea. Uh, uh, so, well, when uh, Prime Minister Modi visited Korea in 2015, uh, the as, as I mentioned before, the relationship was um, rebranded as a special strategic partnership. Well, it was part and parcel of a, a narrative 
change in India's approach to the whole East, uh, look East policy, because the look East policy was sort of upgraded as active policy to, to enhance and project India's uh, enhanced approach to, uh, to, to East Asian countries. Uh, however, nothing much happened, particularly because of the lack of political will, particularly on the part of Korea, because 2015-16 was Korea uh, was a context in which Korea was occupied with Korean Peninsula issues, and also 2016-17 went through a political crisis. So, in that sense, the announcement of NSP in 2017 was sort of welcome uh, uh, in India and sort of complemented the activist policy of Prime Minister Modi in 2015. Um, but, and, and, and it was clearly reflected in the joint statement in 2018 when President Moon Jae-in visited India uh, and, 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 and adopted a joint uh, statement which sought um, uh, to build, uh, build on the strategic partnership, uh, the special strategic partnership. And the Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Korea in February uh, 2019 also uh, cemented uh, that momentum of the relationship. But if you were to look at the, the empirical aspects of the relationship, uh, under New Southern policy, uh, the relation, political relationship has significantly improved, uh, particularly in the 2017 onwards. Um, uh, and to, to give an, in, uh, to give an uh, example, I mean, the Prime Minister Modi and President Moon Jae-in had uh, eight summit, well, uh, bilateral as well as uh, in the, um, the sidelines of international uh, diplomatic events. Uh, this is also reflective in, and the, in the enhanced relationship has also been reflective, reflected in the, in the shared regional vision of 2018 is reflect sort of a strategic convergence. But I have to say in the post 2020 context, uh, there has been a perception of strategic divergence. It's, 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 um, it needs to be contextualized the India's geopolitical, uh, India's shift to geopolitics in its foreign policy approach, particularly the post uh, pandemic uh, context, and also uh, uh, in the aftermath of India China conflict in, in the summer of 2020. And it's also the context in which uh, the Korea was sort of adopting a sort of an ambiguous approach to the Pacific, which um, kept itself out of the uh, the regional arrangements that were forming in the in, in that particular context, in the form of uh, the Quad Plus or or, or, or the other uh, forums that were emerging, so it sort of created a strategic perception uh, in 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 the Indian strategic thinkers as far as India-Korea relations is concerned. And uh, the other aspect in which India relation India-Korea relations have significantly improved is in the field of defense and. Um, a defense um, cooperation, and this has been reflected particularly in defense industry cooperation, um, where there have been uh, several deals, including joint production and also joint design, as well as also a significant improvement in maritime security with India and Korea signing a logistical agreement, maritime logistic agreement in 2019. Well, well uh, the relationship also have have seen some momentum on the economic field. Uh, let me show some slides. Um, well, well, the, uh, well, I mean, as far as uh, India, uh, in, uh, a major component of NSP, uh, so to say, was the economic diversification agenda, which saw India as an opportunity to to diversify Korea's economic, uh, some of the Korea's economic relationship, uh, economic engagement with China. Uh, on that front, there has been some reflect, uh, some momentum. Uh, some Korean companies have uh, uh, started investing in, in, in India, but not much. Uh, so, uh, this has also reflected uh, some momentum in the trade, but not much, uh, because India-Korea relation, uh, trade has been stagnant uh, since 2010, um, it, it was hovering around uh, $20 billion. Uh, let me briefly conclude uh, with some of my uh, observation. Uh, while the NSP provided, a, the announcement of the NSP provided new momentum uh, to India Korea relations, how I failed to maintain that momentum and, and that, that is reflective of 
particularly uh, that's uh, uh, the failure to maintain the moment that happened particularly out of the geopolitical uh, divergence um, well let me also say some of the uh, uh, the hindrance for india korea relations uh, under nsp nsp from an indian perspective viewed uh, india primarily through the lens of market it failed to recognize india as a strategic and geopolitical actor uh, so in that sense, it's uh, so it as an extension of, of the ASEAN market. Um, and and uh, I will also highlight that the putting in ASEAN and India together was also problematic because um, these are two different entities and two different kinds of access. So uh, putting them in one basket was also a challenge um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, well, creating a, a coherent perception. Well, and, 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 and the another important point is Korea's ambiguity on Indo-Pacific and India's turn to geopolitical, uh, geopolitics in its regional approach uh, brought about a perception of strategic divergence, uh, particularly in the post-COVID context, as I mentioned before. Uh, with the UN administration's uh, proactive approach to Indo-Pacific, I think there will be a more room for india korea relations going forward. I'll stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed. So I think you really kind of showed us some of the challenges there that are facing um, uh, Korean engagement uh, with India. Um, so what I'd like to do now is bring in <coughs> the three uh, speakers, the um, uh, so Aaron and Dr. Miliana talking about Southeast Asia and yourself talking about India. Uh, if anybody in the audience has any uh, questions for on, on this topic, please type them in the Q&A box. But maybe I could ask the three of you to reflect on, for example, what, do you think that uh, Korea is getting good value for money <laughs> out of this? In some, what would it, um, you know, if they had to justify it to their own taxpayers, you know, kind of what are they, is there a financial return? Do you think it's paying its way? Uh, opinion polls, that kind of thing. How would you, how, if, if you were the, uh, you know, the, the Korean government, how would you justify this in, in terms of, you know, the, the view from your own particular countries or, or regions? Dr. Noliano, I saw you had your hand up there. Yeah, I think in terms of value for money with uh, South Korea's relations to Southeast uh, Asia, it's definitely there. It's because of um, just overall the level of trade. Uh, South Korea is also part of the RCEP that just kicked in recently. And in fact, that was even one of the criticism that, that the UN administration has had that the NSP really has been too trade focused. So essentially in terms of what South Korea gets from its enhanced relationship with ASEAN, really in terms of, of the larger marketplace, um, the places for businesses to, 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 to go in, even at times or even at places where South Korea is the largest donor, much of the donor doesn't come in form of grants, uh, but, but mostly in, on, on loans and concessional loans. So even though Vietnam, for example, is the largest uh, donor recipient for South Korea, it also has large you know, economic trade-offs uh, for South Korea as well. So in that sense, I think South Korea's focus on ASEAN has shown um, exactly the comparative of why it, it's probably less so with India, even though the NSP has supposed is supposed to cover both India and Southeast Asia. Thanks, Georgian. Uh, well, I mean, as I mentioned, there wasn't much money invested in NSP towards India. So in that sense, uh, uh, I think the return was good because the it changed the perception both in Korea and in India about India Korea relations. It's 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 but uh, it's it's failed to maintain the when I said failed to maintain the momentum. Perhaps it was it's it's a, it's a short phenomenon, but I think in the long term it will pay off uh, because it's changed the the narrative and that also created a sort of expectation gap. Well, which need to be addressed in some sense or the other in the later stage. But as far as India, sorry, the ASEAN's case, I, I think it was actually um, supposed to happen a little early because, see, if you look at the the Korea's the total trade volume, ASEAN is perhaps the the number two trade partner of South Korea at this point of time. So it was natural to do that. Uh, but as far as India is concerned, uh, well, it's. 
well, it's not really reflective of that aspect, but I think it's it's the future uh, that the South Koreans are looking at. And uh, if you look at, say, for example, uh, the the South Koreans are actually invested heavily also in terms of their knowledge production about India and Asia and, and uh, recently, and more so in Asia, but less so in India. And this is, was also a problem uh, of uh, Korea's approach to India under NSP because it was the ASEAN uh, and the experts who actually devised the, the, <laughs> the NSP and failed to understand India's unique aspects and uh, failed to understand India's uh, geopolitical and strategic role in the region. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you. Aaron, anything to add? Sorry, I think the value, I mean, for young people, I think it has been the, I mean, the Korean wave. I mean, Hallyu has been, um, if they were to sell that um, and say that, you know what, now Hallyu is so much, it has been enhanced in Southeast Asia. I think that's something they would buy because it has been, I mean, over the years, at, the, at least in Malaysia, uh, you, could, you could see the uh, trajectory and how much uh, people have sort of from, I mean, initially interest in, I mean, Korean movies, Korean dramas, and now it's food, now it's K-pop. Um, so that has definitely still is um, a, a huge interest, um, at least in the Asian market. One thing, uh, if, that, I, yeah. if I may add, I mean, there's one point, I mean, uh, since it, the Halley was mentioned, I think uh, there has been a significant, uh, uh, um, I mean, I think I, I would say that the Korean government has failed to leverage on the, the Halley, particularly in the Indian context. Why, why do you think that is? Because, I mean, Hallyu is so massive in Southeast Asia. It just it, 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 it's becoming massive in India also. Okay. Yeah, there are different ways to it, but I think, um, well, as far as Korean image in India is concerned, uh, it is, uh, it's the BTS or the Korean drama that actually played a critical role. It was not the Korean government for that matter. So, but they, <laughs> I think they failed to take advantage of it. I mean, perhaps they have to see India through a different lens to take advantage of it. Um, I, I, I think it was, uh, Nuliana, you mentioned RCEP, um, and, and I just wondered whether, obviously, India famously refused to join RCEP, um, and I just wondered whether the contrasting relations between, you know, kind of how South Korea has engaged with ASEAN compared to the, the, the less successful engagement with India, should we say, has that turned into an argument that perhaps RCEP ought to be looked at again and we need to be more integrated into that region, Jojin? Mm, um, probably, I think at least the answer that I can offer on my end is that in terms of economic engagement overall, ASEAN and the rest of the East Asian countries, Japan, China and South Korea has been much longer, much deeper. So in particular, the market within the region and ASEAN's own supply chain within the region is definitely a lot deeper and more significant than ASEAN and India uh, in terms of like the higher end, you know, mid to higher end production goods. So um, that could be a factor rather more so than anything to do with the NSP and ASEAN and India's relation rather than ASEAN's relation to the East Asian side. So that would probably be more of the argument factor there. Georgian? Well, I mean, as you know, the India and Korea already has a, a free trade agreement and, 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 so, and India is also part of the larger, the ASEAN uh, free trade, uh, though it opted out to, of the RCEP. But I think, well, I mean, as I mentioned, one of the reasons uh, also need to highlight is the, the, the reforms that need to be uh, brought in in India. Uh, is also responsible for not taking off the relationship. So it's not a Korean problem, but also an Indian problem. Uh, but of course, um, it's a political issue. Uh, uh, but I think one of one major problem in terms of not taking India-Korea relations, or particularly the economic relations forward, is the lack of India fitting into the supply chain or the or the production networks that you see in Southeast Asia. The, India has, to some extent, get into that production network, then India-Korea relations will also be uh, reflect in, on that front. So, uh, thank you. And maybe one last question before you go. 
do you does do you think this relationship or these relationships are constructed as a relationship of partners and equals or does south korea approach asean and india as the giver of culture the giver of high technology or whatever and uh, is is there a sort of a condescension in there does that cause an issue or is it actually more egalitarian than, than you might think Er, uh, you want to take this or shall I also answer? I mean, um, yeah, I can just give some and then you can add. Um, I think um, it's it's difficult to look at in terms of equality if you want to look at ASEAN and South Korea, I think because there's two different groups um, in ASEAN itself. Um, so it's no longer CLMV, CLM. And then Vietnam is now sort of um, ahead of the other um, ASEAN four as well. So it's, it's, it's quite... Um, difficult to to see equality um, in terms of um, because you're looking at it as as a block, so uh, so that's a challenge uh, definitely. But what we saw with uh, the NSP is they def definitely an attempt to sort of um, elevate. Um, so not to I'm not sh I'm not sure whether it has been well whether there's still um, an equal uh, level between ASEAN and South Korea as well as the other four major powers, but there is an attempt to elevate, but we're still not there yet uh, because of uh, the challenge of the different developments uh, within ASEAN, different developments uh, stages of ASEAN member state itself. So that's uh, my point. So Dr. Rana, I would like to add. Uh, actually, just exactly along the lines of, of Aaron's answer, there are some countries in, in ASEAN that South Korea has definitely approached on an equal footing and partnership, you know, more so in the way they've approached, for example, Thailand in terms of the arms deal and with uh, Singapore and Malaysia, no doubt as well. Uh, and, and Indonesia too. Indonesia is probably also one of their bigger uh, investment growth uh, lately. So there is that difference, but definitely in the relation that they've had, for example, in the Mekong subregion, there is a clear, you know, donor or higher giver state than than uh, with some of the ASEAN countries. Well, as far as India is concerned, I, uh, well, it's a difficult question to ask uh, to answer. Uh, but I think, well, there seems to be, and, and the relationship seems to be on an equal footing as reflective of strategic partnership. Uh, I mean, there seems not to be a hierarchical nature in terms of the relationship. Uh, but I think, uh, well, even if there, there, there was some in the past, but I think uh, of late, it's been of, 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 of an, of, on an equal footing. So I don't, well, I mean, I, I don't hear any kind of perception within the Indian strategic community uh, to s complaining about uh, Korea push, um, for um, putting its weights in, in, in terms of relationship. I don't see that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just that might be a, a, an angle. It, it's clear that, you know, maybe Korea has avoided some of the uh, mistakes that uh, other sort of donors and potential partners have made uh, in engaging with these two regions. That's but great. Uh, let, uh, well, uh, since you mentioned about it, but actually, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry about it. But uh, as far as India relations, the aid component is very minuscule. So there's actually, uh, there's nothing mm -hmm. uh, to say. So well, that aspect don't come into play as far as, uh, in comparison to Korea ASEAN relations. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Thank you very much. Should we take okay, a five just, minute to go on? So just to add what on, on that, on the, the aid relation, actually, that's part of Korea's formal narrative too when it comes in that it doesn't have baggage in terms of like uh, historical agendas in ASEAN uh, in the Southeast Asian country. And they use that to promote as part of their aid program. So that's interesting to note. Mm -hmm. Gives them an advantage over some other players, maybe. Great. Thank you very much. Should we take a five minute break? I'm, I'm going to get a cup of coffee uh, and then we'll be back. Uh, so mute your microphones. Um, uh, I'll put a slide up uh, and then we'll come back uh, at uh, 20 past the hour. Dr. Lee, um, you're going to talk to us about Taiwan's 
version of uh, the southbound policy and how that's changed. Are you uh, good to go? Yep, I'm good to go. Yep. Great. Okay, thanks so much. Let me share my slide. All right. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, there are Okay. Yeah, should be. You managed to see my slide here? Yeah? Can see the slide. Yeah, if you um, put it okay. on presentation okay, mode. Sure. Okay. All right. Okay. Good morning. And of course, uh, to those who are in the other side of the world. Well, well, other side of the world, yeah. uh, good evening, or even good afternoon. Yeah, some. Uh, okay, uh, I will be presenting, uh, uh, let's say, Taiwan's new subbound policy. I put it as uh, NSPT. So uh, what I'm going to do here is not going to talk about, uh, uh, to just generally talk about what is uh, Taiwan's NSPT, but uh, I would like to come up with a conceptual framework. Uh, 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 on Taiwan's soft power projection uh, within this uh, uh, NSPT. So uh, let's start with the literature. So most scholarly works today do not delve into the process of our soft power uh, projection overseas uh, via the uh, NSPT. So like uh, my current director, uh, Neil Chaoping, uh, traces the evolution of uh, the NSPT. Uh, uh, well, he termed it as the Go South Policy 3.0. Uh, there are different layer, different versions of ghost uh, South policy for Taiwan over the years. So there are different, and, there, and he basically concludes that the policy is meant to strive for increase of mutual presence between Taiwan and ASEAN. So that increase of mutual presence doesn't mean that uh, it will be a significant to his argument. So, and then this was, uh, this, this, this uh, Taiwanese scholar, Huang Kuibo, calls uh, for the Thai administration to work with the NSPT countries and even China to find a win-win solution in pushing this high-profile policy. So to Huang, if China is an uh, obstacle for Taiwan's uh, push for this uh, NSPT, uh, this NSPT will not be, uh, will not be uh, I mean, will be symbolically successful rather than uh, uh, truth, uh, rather, than, rather than in substantial forms, you know? And then we have these, Ameri these two American scholars from Kennedy and Funayo who highlight the for strategic foresight and comprehensiveness of the Thai administration in pushing the uh, new sub uh, NSPT as opposed to, their, to her predecessors. And then we have also Marston and Bush who assesses the impacts uh, and challenges of the NSPT as well as emphasizes emphasize people to people ties as the driver of the policy. Of course, the other Taiwanese scholar, Li Chun Yi, uh, examine the case of Vietnam, and he, she basically concludes that economic diplomacy's impact of the NSPT is limited. This is unlike education cooperation, uh, especially in the case of Vietnam, it was very stark uh, uh, improvements or even results uh, in that uh, Southeast Asian country. So basically her argument is that private businesses, Taiwanese private businesses are market oriented, and they are not like, they are not uh, state driven. Unlike those in uh, those uh, Chinese, uh, China's uh, state -owned enterprises who are working alongside with the uh, with the state with the central government to push this uh, BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, and then we have these uh, two Indonesian and Andoko Rafani and one Taiwani scholar who see soft resources or so as what we call it the resources of soft power, the soft resources as an advantage for Taiwan to build cooperation in the agricultural sector. Uh, the four primary objectives that they see it is to build, uh, let's say, to uh, engage, uh, to make Taiwan connected to Southeast Asia via regional uh, supply chains, to export Taiwan's products and technologies overseas, uh, to uh, uh, establish something uh, value added to, uh, to, to, to give value added uh, to the region by establishing this uh, food production zone. Uh, for uh, for the regional countries, uh, in case they they are running when they run into this uh, food security problem, they will can take a tap on this food production zones for their domestic uh, or for their regional supply. You know, so uh, of course there are also these uh, human resources uh, uh, in terms of the farmers training, 
farmers' knowledge that they that uh, our Southeast Asia can really tap on uh, uh, through uh, Taiwan's push for this uh, NSPT in the agriculture sector. So basically, all of these uh, scholars do not really delve in the process of soft power projection overseas. So how? But before that, I would like to give some yeah some background on Taiwan's regional policies in the past. So if we start with this uh, Jiang, the two Jiangs or the the two Jiangs era, where there is uh, there's no no standalone regional policy. Uh, at that time, one China foreign policy is a principle based policy with one China principle. So as the core, so this policy basically uh, puts ROC as the sole representative of China. So uh, because of this policy, because of this uh, uh, principle based policy. Uh, after the uh, 1971, the, uh, the US-China uh, approached more, so China was uh, uh, left with a handful of diplomatic allies and it was no longer, it was no longer recognized because of, the, of, it, of it no longer being recognized as a representative of China. So it was the, uh, the side, I mean, the repercussions of this uh, one China-based uh, foreign policy. Of course, the the other side of it is that because of this, uh, the element of Chinese in this policy, Taiwan still managed to solicit overseas Chinese investments, especially those from ASEAN countries. And then with the uh, 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 with the uh, with democratiz democratization of Taiwan gathering pace in the nineteen in the late nineteen eighties, the Li Denghui administration they, they came out with a go south policy. So this is the first version of Go South policy, which emphasized on this pragmatic diplomacy. Basically, it's based on a diplomatic confrontation with China, but, but within this larger context of diplomatic con confrontation with China, uh, Taiwan ought to be practical in finding enough, uh, in finding tapping itself into the regional uh, ties with, uh, with the uh, neighbors uh, South, so that, uh, China will not be isolated. So Taiwan will not be isolated. Sorry for that. So, and because of that, it uh, also to tackle economic in the our dependence on China and the expand international space, as I, uh, I mentioned earlier. So there are uh, five notable measures altogether, but most of uh, all of them are economically oriented. This is very interesting because when they when Li Donghui was a uh, 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 Within this Li Donghui's uh, pragmatic diplomacy, uh, expanding international space is the strategic aim. But uh, when it comes to notable measures, how to implement them, the, this particular element was missing in this whole, uh, uh, in these uh, five notable measures for uh, how uh, to engage with the uh, neighbors down south. Yeah, yeah. it includes these, uh, those from uh, uh, Indian subcontinent as well. And then we come on to this uh, Chen Shui-bing administration. Uh, this is the era where, China, uh, where Taiwan started this uh, Go South policy 2.0. Again, the over-dependence on the Chinese market remain a major concern. So now, but the thing is that uh, the Chen Shui-bing administration added one strategic aim, another new strategic aim, which is to sign FTAs with ASEAN countries. And this is in Tally with the a uh, larger context at that time where people, where, where uh, countries over uh, around the world have been tapping on these free trade arrange, uh, agreements uh, with each other. So, but again, uh, you could say that it would be large, largely unsuccessful due to China's appealing investment climate. So most of the Taiwanese uh, investments uh, go, went, to Taiwan, uh, went to China instead of going to uh, ASEAN countries. So, uh, but again, it is also because of this Chen administration, soft power is coined for the first time during his uh, administration. And, uh, and, but however, it was not documented. And to uh, Chen Shui-bin, the Chen administration is about this, the soft power uh, is revolves around these two soft resources, democracy and civil society. And then later on, when the Mainzhou took over the administration in 2008, so we have, uh, he came out with this, uh, he doesn't have a very, he didn't have a very strong uh, uh, go south uh, view, but it was more like the way of uh, 
uh, viable diplomacy to uh, foster border, better ties with China. And from a better ties with China, he was hoping that Taiwan can just uh, tap in into this uh, existing framework at that time, 10 plus three, just ASEAN plus three. So he was thinking about Taiwan better can add another one into it as another layer to it is a trend plus three plus one for regional economic integration in order to uh, make sure that Taiwan did not uh, uh, get isolated uh, within the larger economic integration process at the time. So he managed to secure an economic partnership agreement with Singapore in 2013. And this was without Beijing's strong opposition. And then the, again, the, and, and his, uh, and his, in his administration, soft power is, is readjusted into peace, culture, and prosperity. Like the Chen administration, he did not document all soft power within the government docu uh, documents at that time. So, and then we will come on to this. I will just uh, briefly explain about this, the birth of NPT, NSPT uh, during the Chai Yingwen administration. Uh, since uh, May 2016 and uh, its basic tenets. So in May uh, 2016, uh, when uh, Chai Yun was uh, formally uh, uh, announced, uh, when Chai Yun formally took over the power and in her inauguration speech, he basically uh, uh, made two very important, uh, say, uh, disclosure to the public about uh, what is this NSPT at the time? So it was conceptualized as a, as a hybrid policy. So within his speech, you, you can see that there's this economic elements. There also these economic aims. There also these uh, policy, foreign policy aims. So they, they are both, uh, so it's best considered as a hybrid policy in her speech. And then at that time, the second thing is that uh, she wanted to extend uh, her, uh, let's say signature uh, initiative, call it, she called it as the new model of, of economic development into overseas. So the new model of economic development is for Taiwan's domestic economic development. It was based on the core values of innovation, employment and equitable distribution. So, so he was, she was trying to uh, replicate this or you know, export this model into overseas. And then with that, she was hoping and then she was, and then she clearly spelled out in her speech that she wanted to end Taiwan's over reliance on the single market. And in this case, it is China. So, and then uh, when the uh, uh, NSPT document was, uh, uh, the guidelines of NSPT was uh, officially revealed with a uh, later uh, that year. And uh, they, are, they were all together the uh, three strategic aims. And again, all these strategic aims are economic oriented. Again, the foreign policy aim, the foreign policy strategic aim to expand Taiwan's international space, again, missing in this overall NSPT. So the first uh, uh, strategic aim is to re redefine Taiwan's uh, important role in Asia development. Second, we'll identify a new direction, a new driving force, a new stage of, island, of the island's economic development. And thirdly is to create a future value uh, through this NSPT for Taiwan's uh, uh, Render economic trade strategy. Yeah. So, and of course, when we talk about SP NSPT, this is about the soft power. The soft you power. Say three, two or three more minutes, Carl. All right. All right. So, the soft power. So, I would like to, I'm sorry for that. It's a bit of technical. Oh, sorry for that. Okay. So when I, I want to go uh, into this, uh, 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 this uh, slide, uh, except that uh, there are three resources of soft power, namely technology, people, culture, uh, which is uh, documented in the guidelines of the NSP. So, uh, so this is my model, my analytical model of how Taiwan soft power projection works via the NSPPT. So it starts with this NSP's uh, strategic aims, the three strategic aims that I mentioned before. From there on to be the uh, utilizable soft resources, culture, technology, knowledge, foreign policies, humanistic values. Then will be the other one will be the opportunistic perceptions. So the identification of focus entry points for the utilization of a soft resources to achieve the NSPT's three strategic aims. And finally, the promotion strategies. There's two pronged promotion strategy here. 
First is to encourage targeted state, sub-state and non-state actors to participate. And the, third, and the, the other one is implementing focused programs or projects to achieve the NSPT's strategic aims. So from this commercial strategies, it should, it should end up back into the NSPT's uh, strategic aims. So we have the whole thing is to make sure that Taiwan is uh, working in line with the NSP's three strategic aims, as I mentioned earlier. So there are many sectors we put here, the medical sectors. So you can see the soft resources, technology, technology, knowledge, entry point, sharing of know-how, export of medical technologies. The commercial strategy will be the one country, one center project as uh, Professor Yang mentioned earlier. The other will be the agriculture, the soft resources again will be a technology knowledge, the sharing of know-how, export of agricultural technologies inventions, commercial strategy will be the flagship program uh, for regional agricultural development. The manufacturing sector, for the manufacturing sector, the soft resources, technology knowledge escape again, the entry points, innovating partners, industries, export manufacturing products and equipment, national branding of Taiwan. So again, the commercial strategy will be another flagship program for industrial innovation and operation. So tourism, this is even more interesting. Uh, the soft resources will be the foreign tourism policy to rebrand foreign policy, tourism policy into a foreign policy with the external component in it. And then the traditional culture, such as the Hakka culture being used for uh, developing ecotourism tapping. And, and for foreign tourism policy, it will be more about tapping halal tourism in Southeast Asian countries. The conversion strategy will be the tourism development action plan, the four-year plan. Uh, uh, that Taiwan developed back in uh, 2017, if I'm not wrong, yeah, with the time. So the education will be the soft resources, knowledge for education policy, culture, entry points, providing vocational training. Uh, this is a, is a great example with uh, simplified in Vietnam, the short-term exchanges, full-time studies, another flagship program for industrial talent development. The civil society, the humanistic values, foreign aid policy, knowledge, Again, networking with Asian civil society, talent incubation, NGOs, capacity building, joint advocacy of issues. So this is uh, something that has been uh, promoted uh, heavily by uh, uh, Professor Young's uh, organization, the TAEF. So they have this TAEF program on civil society connectivity. And then they work together with Taiwan Aid as well. So this is my last slide here. So I will see the whole thing. There are three challenges of NSPT's implementation. So I won't go detail because uh, my other two colleagues will be able to, to have more uh, inputs on this. So uh, the China's pressure is always there and will be more prominent. So Beijing's constriction of Taiwan international space has been a norm in Southeast Asia and even uh, in uh, India. And then uh, it will intensify further with the, even this fight further with, uh, with uh, US-China rivalry becoming a new normal in SPT countries. The, the second challenge will be higher demand in for Taiwan to grasp and respond to the dynamic to the dynamic political situation, economic situation in Southeast Asia. So they have see political economic volatilities in the post-COVID era, change in government, public fiscal difficulties, climate change impacts, and middle income trends. So there are a lot of challenges that Taiwan uh, has to understand in order uh, for them to engage uh, with the Southeast Asian counterparts, especially. Uh, even India. So there's also immense coordination needed among state, sub-state and non-state actors. Uh, I don't see any big, not as big as the challenge uh, to coordinate among state agencies, but more of uh, how to harmonize the interest, uh, the interest of these private businesses, the Taiwanese private businesses in line with these uh, NSPT's three strategic aims. So they are market driven and how we, how Taiwan, our Taiwanese government make sure that they uh, do in line with the uh, with the NSPT's uh, strategic, uh, strategic aims, they will be the challenge that I see. And of course, with our focus into cooperation with the uh, with the like-minded Western bloc, uh, will with more European, American, Canadian, uh, Australians counterparts coming in to uh, build more ties with build more ties and cooperation with Taiwan. So, how will uh, this focus? How will their new renew focus? How will their new focus uh, affect their initial focus on the NSPT in the future? So these are three uh, challenges that I see so far. And with that, I end my presentation here. So uh, questions are welcome.
Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Shall we take all the questions in a group at the end? Is that okay with you? Yeah. No problem. Great. Okay. Thanks so much. That's a really helpful. It kind of I think really tells us. I, I think what you're telling us is that this, you know, that it's all about China, isn't it? <laughs> in, a, in a kind of in a, in a kind of way, but it's a, it's a way of uh, you know managing relations uh, with other parts of the region to balance that situation. Thank you. Great. Should we move on to uh, to Sana now, Dr. Sana Hashmi? Uh, you're going to talk about the sort of situating India in the uh, in the new uh, southbound policy. Thank you, Bill. And I would also like to extend my gratitude to Carl for including me in this project. I'm delighted to be a part of this. So I'm going to write on situating India in Taiwan's new southbound policy. So the study aims to situate India in Taiwan's new southbound policy on political, economic, strategic, people to people and cultural domains. So there's a dearth of literature uh, on India-Taiwan relations, especially from an Indian and Taiwanese perspective as well. So literature has mostly focused on relations through India-China lens or cross-strait relations lens. So um, I strongly believe that a comprehensive policy-oriented analysis on Taiwan-India relations, which give the historical dimensions their due, and also aims to focus on the contemporary period with the aim to plug policy gaps, uh, I believe it's very important and this has been missing from the literature. So the study would aim to fill up uh, these key gaps in overall body of literature on the relation in the context of the new suburban policy. So therefore, the proposed study is of critical importance to the scholars of Taiwan studies as well as international relations scholars. So the reason why I've selected this particular topic is because the NSP is ongoing. It's just five years old and India is an important part of this policy. And it's imperative to study the policy for elevating the relationship between India and Taiwan. And this set of relationship is one of the most underrated and underutilized set of relationship in the international arena. And there's a need to focus on avenues for further cooperation. Uh, and as I mentioned that not several books have been, uh, not even edited volumes have been authored on this bilateral aspect of the relations. So Taiwan and India relations have been, uh, it's very important that we look at the NSP as well and not just on the China factor as, and the bilateral level. So uh, a careful study of this uh, India-Taiwan relationship under the framework of NSP may serve as a useful tool to understand how to strengthen the ties further. So uh, a comprehensive work is needed that clearly specifies the most crucial aspect of the relationship. So the research question that I'm going to focus on is what are the ways in which uh, the two governments could invoke the historical past in overcoming diplomatic hurdles and engagement? Then what are the major features and components of the new suburban policy? I know that Carl is going to focus on that, but I'd be focusing on it vis-a-vis uh, -vis India-Taiwan relationship and how uh, the new suburban policy is different from go south, bond, uh, go south policies, the two versions of go south policies when it comes to India-Taiwan relations. And uh, how complementary is Taiwan's new South Bond policy with India's Act East policy, whereas India placed in the new South Bond policy, uh, then what are the potential avenues of synergy between India's eastward engagement and the NSP? And since the NSP has completed um, almost six years, what are the achievements and weaknesses of the policy vis-a-vis -vis India? And finally, what are the ways to elevate Taiwan-India ties in bilateral as well as regional context? So the structure of the article uh, would focus on a comparison of India-Taiwan relationship before and after the NSP, and then what is the current status of the relationship and Taiwan's perspective on its ties with India, then what has been India's approach and how reciprocal India has been, uh, then what are the opportunities in the relationship, challenges and roadblocks, and finally, what is the way forward? So Taiwan, uh, Carl already mentioned that Taiwan launched the NSP in 2016, and since then India has been a key target country within the new South One policy framework. And as China became more aggressive with Taiwan and cross strait relations further deteriorated, it began to reach out to countries that were not on Taiwan's strategic radar traditionally. So this led to the launch of the new South One policy. And uh, one of the primary objectives of the NSP has been to reduce the reliance on a single market that is China and diversify its external engagement that goes beyond, of course, the US, European countries, and as well as ASEAN. So there is a mis uh, conception about the new suburban policy that it has been primarily launched to strengthen ties with the Southeast Asian countries. It's not been the case. The primary objective has been to reach out to South Asia and Australia and New Zealand because with the Go South policy, Taiwan's engagement with Southeast Asia was already robust. So from Taiwan's perspective and how India has become important for Taiwan in the recent years, 
uh, it has begun to refocus its attention to countries uh, other than the ASEAN from the from 2016 from the coming of uh, dpp and signing one to power um, the nsp was launched when dpp came to power and in, in her in sign one's campaign she talked about reaching out to countries diversifying taiwan's relation and this has been taiwan's flagship foreign policy initiative since then so of course there have been previous iteration of the policy go south policy uh, that was carl already talked about initiated by uh, president lee thang hui and then carried forward by chan shupian which was not really carried forward by my NGO. So uh, what has changed with the new southern policy is the geographical scope and areas of cooperation that have been extended to um, primarily India, Australia, and New Zealand. So the new southern policy holds immense relevance for Taiwan. It aims to strengthen cooperation, trade, and strengthen ties in the wider Indo-Pacific region. It already has robust ties with the US and its ties with Japan are also on track, but there was a need to reinforce ties with countries which are now a part of the new sub one policy. Uh, now, India is actively becoming an important part of Taiwan's uh, political strategic thinking. And it's unprecedented that Taiwan has a policy for countries in the South Asian region. And six countries from this region are part of this policy. And it's also very important for Taiwan, if it wants to have a credible South Asia policy, it also has to uh, start this credible South Asia policy with India. So this is also important when Taiwan does not have diplomatic ties with any of these countries, especially India. So I think this is where new suburban policy plays an important role. And there's definitely a lot of synergy in India's activist policy and new suburban policy. Taiwan is not an official part of India's activist policy. So these policies are providing a foundation and a long-term framework for uh, India and Taiwan to look towards each other. Then NSP is intrinsically linked to Taiwan's Indo-Pacific policy as well. Uh, we also have to look at it from the perspective of Taiwan's interest in the Indo-Pacific. India is an important part of the region. Uh, in fact, there is there could be no Indo-Pacific without India. And Taiwan has on several occasions expressed willingness to play an important role in the region. In fact, Tsai Ing-wen has stated that NSP is complementary to uh, US freedom of uh, navigation operation free and open Indo-Pacific, Japan's EPQI and India's AEP. So for Taiwan, focusing on India and cooperation with India will also mean greater visibility and credibility in the Indo-Pacific region. And when we specifically talk about Taiwan-India relationship, since 2020, we have seen that Taiwan's uh, status in the uh, international liberal order has changed, so has India's relation with Taiwan. So 2020 was a year when several countries were compelled to talk about Taiwan and notice what Taiwan has been doing. With respect to India-Taiwan relations, one silver, silver lining uh, in this age of the pandemic is that there is unprecedented discussion and enthusiasm about Taiwan and India. And the domestic discourse in India has visibly shifted in Taiwan's favor. And uh, now with the violent standoff between India and China in 2020, we have witnessed how they have been forced to advance ties with Taiwan. Uh, when KMT Kuomintang was in power, there was mutual neglect and lack of ambition from both sides. But now since the DPP is in power, uh, for the very first time, Taiwan is trying to engage India actively. And New Southern policy has an important role to play here. We have seen some achievement, we have seen a, a few outcomes, but of course uh, it's not enough. And despite all these positive developments and efforts from both the sides, the potential of this relationship still remains underutilized. And if you look at the scale of cooperation or depth in India-Taiwan relationship, it's uh, nothing in comparison to what Taiwan's uh, relationship with other Asian countries have been. So for, look at ASEAN, Taiwan-ASEAN relation, look at Taiwan-Japan relation. So what we have seen is that the government to government interactions still remain limited very much to the scope of economic relationship or to some extent technology now and our people to people relationship are also acquiring uh, more uh, uh, weight. But uh, the problem here is the lack of reciprocity from India's side. We see all these positive developments, but there is still more to achieve in this relationship. And from India's perspective, its approach is restricted. Despite problems with China, India, even though it doesn't mention about the one China policy uh, on ground, we know that it still adheres to the one China policy. But of course, in the past two years, we have been seeing that there is some rethinking on the one China policy. And uh, India, in fact, there is a change in India's Taiwan policy as well. For the very first time, India talked about uh, China's militarization of the Taiwan Strait. It called out China for unilaterally changing the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. And even at the domestic level, we are seeing there are a few subtle policy changes vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. 
but of course, uh, one major obstacle, this is a major obstacle that still remains that India-China's tacit understanding on the one China policy remains. Uh, but of course, I believe that this should not be a constrained relation with Taiwan could be easily managed while India keep adhering to the one China policy. Parallel, parallel ties could be maintained with the, both Taiwan and uh, China. And this has been Taiwan's official policy too. So the focus is not on security and defense ties when we talk about advancement in relationship, but the emphasis is more on increasing the avenues for cooperation in areas that do not harm India and Taiwan's respective equations and relations with China. Uh, then. Apart from China factor, there's another major hurdle. Uh, when we talk about the NSP and how NSP is providing a framework to India-Taiwan relationship, what India is looking from Taiwan is consistency. So there is a forthcoming approach by the lead DP, from DPP-led government. There is a greater focus on Indo-Pacific partnership with like-minded countries. It's all there, but a concern uh, from India size is that, that will this be carried forward if KMT comes to power? So there are serious doubts regarding this in India, and in a way it restricts India's long-term policy change. Uh, but no matter what, what we have to appreciate NSP for, that it has kind of provided, even if it's for short term, there is a consistency. And India knows that Taiwan is more proactive towards India when DPP is in power. Uh, so now it's important to look at the practical aspect of the relations and giving policy recommendations that are feasible to both Taiwan and India. And what is significant here is a holistic approach that should be adopted that should cover cultural, socio-economic, strategic, and science and technology domains. So both sides could work together at bilateral, regional, and multilateral levels to elevate ties within the existing framework of relations. So at the bilateral level from Taiwan side, the focus could be on enhancing the people-centric approach of the NSP in its relation with India. NSP is a people-centric policy. So it has to improve the prospect of people a uh, centric approach of the NSP uh, with India and a sustained focus is needed for strengthening tourism, cultural, educational aspect of the relation. Um, also, what is important to acknowledge that this takes the relation could be only improved if Taiwan encourages businesses to invest more in India. Right now, India does not really have a lot of stake at the bilateral level. It doesn't have a lot of stakes in Taiwan. So this is something that the NSP has not been able to do, not in India, at least. Uh, after the NSP and the signing of a few economic agreements, economic relations have certainly improved. There are more efforts to strengthen commercial ties as well. Uh, but what we have to assess and analyze is the willingness and keenness to strengthen economic ties has anything to do with the NSP. So this is something that has not been studied yet. Uh, from India's side, there's a need for semi-political steps towards Taiwan. Uh, as both India and Taiwan facing similar challenges, there's a need for India to include Taiwan in its act East policy as well as in its wider Indo-Pacific policy. The idea behind the Indo-Pacific is to counter similar concerns through collective efforts. So Taiwan could play an important role here. And there are a number of political, semi-political steps that India could take. India should strive to strengthen bilateral ties and expand areas of cooperation with Taiwan. Of course, I've already mentioned security cooperation is not really uh, within the framework of the NSP as well as not on the card for now. But India too would want to highlight and could really highlight the security component of the bilateral relation, for example, non-combatant -com component can certainly be worked out. And moreover, cooperation in the fields of culture, education, science, and technology development assistance should be strengthened through linking the uh, ACTIS policy with the NSP. And no matter what, Taiwan is positioned in the Indo-Pacific. One very important idea is that the Indo-Pacific region is taking shape. Taiwan is becoming an important beneficiary, not because Indo-Pacific is perceived to be drawn against China, but the fact that Indo-Pacific believes in open, rule-based, inclusive order. So this is important on several counts. One, uh, because we say one or two more minutes. Yes, I'm, I'm, it's I, my conclusion. So the region is designed to maintain a rules based order than Taiwan's participation as an entity which is geographically located within the region is very important. Uh, then rules based Indo Pacific order has to include Taiwan. Also, given China's invasion of Taiwan will be detrimental to the interest of the countries in the Indo-Pacific region, and it goes against the basic tenets of the Indo-Pacific, it is important for India to consider uh, having its own response in a Taiwan, potential Taiwan contingency. This is specifically important given how important India is becoming to other like-minded countries approach in the Indo-Pacific. So to conclude, I would say that uh, for India and Taiwan, China has decided the course of uh, India-Taiwan relationship. And given how fast and dramatic changes are being witnessed in the Indo-Pacific region, China factor has to be minimized here. 
and it will be beneficial for both uh, India and Taiwan to look beyond the China factor and focus on short and not focus on short term priorities and perhaps have a viable feasible policy that focuses on long term goals in the relationship. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed. I think that was a really kind of quite hard headed assessment of the of the challenges ahead. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and so um, I'll turn to our final presenter, uh, Dr. Noor Shahada Jamil uh, from the Institute of China Studies at the University of Malaya. Um, and you're going to talk about um, the deepening regional integration. So you're going to kind of <laughs> talk about, excuse me, the China factor head on. Over to you. Right. Um, thank you, Bill. And then good day, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So the title of my paper today is um, Taiwan New South Wales Policy and the China Factor and how can we deepen regional integration in this new reality? So um, the paper basically argues that China's recent soft power activism in Southeast Asia, although still have limited appeal and impact, but it does have the potential to make it more difficult and more complicated for Taiwan in further projecting its soft power in Southeast Asia through the NSP. And um, as we all may know, soft power serves as a very important foreign policy tool for Taiwan because of its fragile position in the international system and also increasing press, uh, pressure from China. And this is largely because of the fact that Taipei's hard power resources are intractably weak comparing to China. And it is also through the use of soft power that the island can continue to seek support from not only US, but also um, other countries in the international community. So what kind of pressure from China that we are talking about here? Um, one good example can be reflected through the economic dimension, where um, although Taiwanese investment in ASEAN are quite promising, where total trade with ASEAN increased from 78 billion uh, US dollars in 2016 to $89 billion in 2020. But it would be impossible for Taiwan to compete with China in the economic sphere, which is um, the greatest source for contemporary Chinese soft power. Um, just take Malaysia, for, exa for example. China has been Malaysia's uh, largest trading partner for 13 consecutive years, and also our largest foreign investor in the manufacturing sector for six consecutive years. And the same actually goes to uh, its trade with ASEAN, where China has retained its position as ASEAN largest trading partner since 2009. And um, when China launched its Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, we can see how Chinese economic integration into the region has been deepened, right? Although there are some criticism regarding the projects initiated under the BRI umbrella. And um, it is true that Taiwan stood out in terms of the economic sphere since 1960s or 1970s uh, due to its high growth rate and also sectoral transformation where we can witness how it joined countries like South Korea and Singapore as the model of rapid industrialization in Asia. But today, economic and social development alone won't really help Taiwan to stand out strongly in terms of its soft power because there are many other countries in the world that are equally developed at the moment and equally advanced. And let's not forget about the emergence of China as the global economic powerhouse, okay? And um, meanwhile, at the same time, Beijing is also using its economic incentive to strengthen its one China policy um, with the long-term aim to reduce Taiwan's influence, not only in Southeast Asia by pushing Taiwan out of regional diplomacy, but even at the international stage. So um, basically, China has achieved this objective or goals in other parts of the uh, world. For instance, um, Solomon Island has broke its ties with Taiwan in 2019 after switching support to China when the Chinese government promised them a multi-million dollar development fund. Same goes to countries like Panama, Dominican Republic, Burkina Faso, and etc. And it was reported that up till last year, a total of eight countries has severed their relations with Taiwan due to the China factor. And um, we are lucky that such thing doesn't happen or didn't happen between Taiwan and ASEAN due to our longstanding friendship and cooperation. But when 
China keep showering the region with more love? By love, I mean money. So how long will this situation last? Right? To be frank, although Southeast Asian countries do cherish our partnership with Taiwan and we do participate uh, in various programs initiated under the NSP, but the truth is majority of us still refrain from raising this Taiwanese flagship, meaning the NSP publicly, because we fear that we might end up upsetting China. However, um, another point that I want to raise here is that although China's economic incentive or inducement have earned Beijing considerable influence at present, but this kind of influence did not really being translated into Southeast Asian support for its foreign policy or values. In fact, Chinese cultural products or um, cultural appeals have limited appeal among Southeast Asian in comparison with those of the South Korean, Japanese, or even the Taiwanese. And what really narrows down Chinese self, uh, self power here is its own political value, uh, political system, ideology, and the sense of distrust between um, among Southeast Asian countries towards China. So um, this article also opined that Taiwan still enjoy relative advantage in terms of its soft power projection in the region compared to China. And therefore, Taipei must utilize these relative advantages in strengthening the implementation of the NSP in this new reality. So um, what can Taiwan do uh, include, but not limited to? First, to further strengthen its cultural export. And um, I know the Taiwanese government has um, taken necessary step in this because in June 2019, they have established the um, what they call the Taiwan Creative Content Agency or TAICA, which is an organization tasked to help promote and distribute Taiwanese content globally. It is similar to um, the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency that are responsible in promoting Korean Wave or How You, such as, uh, such as K-pop and also K-series like the recent Netflix, uh, Netflix sensation Squid Game. Well, um, while Squid Game is inspired by um, Korean crippling economic issues, Taiwanese entertainment can also tap into social issues in Taiwan. For example, the issue of LGBT without fear of censorship. So I think this would be one of the um, uh, appeal for Taiwan uh, entertainment product. And um, I would also like to highlight that Taipei should also make good use of the social media as platform to export its cultural appeals, which is something that Beijing can't do. And um, at the same time, although Taiwan culture does at large have this deep connection with mainland China, but that actually only constitute to one of the many components of Taiwanese culture, because um, Taiwanese culture is actually very diverse and very unique in the sense that um, it also has its own indigenous culture, as well as a very heavy Dutch, Japanese, American, and also Southeast Asian influences. So what Taipei need to do now is that they need to decide which culture should it choose to display. Or how can the Taiwanese government combine this different culture into one unified component that can best represent um, Taiwan? So um, my second point, or secondly, would be um, as China's political system, ideology, and values being the major challenges in Beijing's soft power activism, so Taiwan should get more active in promoting itself as the opposite. Okay, Taipei should uh, take necessary steps to identify more effective way to promote itself as the world-only culturally Chinese democracy. It should also place greater emphasis on the set of differences it has with um, the mainland China. And um, Taipei should also play the value cards, stressing to the world or to Southeast Asia that unlike China, it shares Western supported values and principles such as democracy, human rights, uh, freedom of speech, among others. And my last point would be, um, to strengthen the implementation of NSP, Taiwan should also identify the niche area where it can focus on in terms of its cooperation with Southeast Asian countries. And um, I know uh, my colleague just now, like um, Chi Leong, Dr. Chi Leong, has mentioned a few sectors uh, where um, Taiwan, Taiwanese government is focusing on, but, um, but identify, identifying this 
niche area itself is not enough. What we need to do is we need to proceed our plan with visible institutionalization of such cooperation. And by visible institutionalization, I'm referring to projects or collaborations that can be seen and felt by the people. For example, in the case of Malaysia, Korean presence in Malaysia can be traced on many aspects. And the most visible is in the construction sector with iconic buildings such as um, the Penang Bridge, Maybank Tower, and one of the very famous Petronas Spin Tower. And then right now we have more of these visible projects under the Chinese flag, under the umbrella of the uh, BRI. So um, Taiwan does not have to join or follow this kind of building game as a latecomer, but instead it should leverage on um, projects that it has relative advantage, but at the same time will have huge impact um, to what the region needs to be visible to, to something that um, people can feel and see. So this is also in line with what Dr. Allen mentioned earlier in his presentation, where um, he said that Taiwan has launched what they call the One Country, One Center program in the medical sector. So I think this is um, something that uh, Taiwan should emphasize on. And um, with that, I think I will end my presentation for today. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think you know your overview of the uh, of the way ahead was uh, was con was a good kind of contrast to some of those sort of earlier presentations we had, with, which were looking at some of the challenges. So I, I guess that was a kind of nice way to to finish the presentations, looking ahead. Um, I, I, I suppose I might, I might begin the, the, the discussion just by asking here. Do you, I mean, is when I hear about this, the Taiwan southbound policy, it often feels like Taiwan is sort of giving a lot. It's giving scholarships, or it's trying to promote its culture, or something. Does it does it see it as a sort of uh, an act of giving, or does it hope that the there will be a sort of there will be an economic return to this, or is the return more abstract, into do, and, or, or, or or more about Taiwan's survival and that, that, that it doesn't really matter therefore how much they spend on these initiatives because it's it's existential. Maybe I just uh yeah I just answer your question first and then I will let my other two colleagues to yeah to talk about huh? yeah um I would say the yeah giving yeah I would say um it's a it's a equal amount of uh, giving and uh uh taking back as I mean the uh let's say the benefits uh from the uh from uh, let's say from uh from not just uh, not new subbound policy of Taiwan but in the past so for example uh, in uh, Malaysia and even in uh, several other countries and uh, uh, Brunei even you know the uh, very uh not that prominent if if, uh, if compared to other uh, countries like of Southeast Asia like Singapore. So uh, there, are, there are people who are working on the ground, uh, pushing forward this uh, uh, Taiwan uh, cooperation with their countries. And all, most of these people are actually educated from Taiwan. They receive the education from Taiwan. So let's say the whole thing is that uh, it's very limited to the Chinese overseas Chinese community in these Southeast Asian countries for itself. So, so the whole thing is that if you, Taiwan has to go to, uh, has to go beyond uh, uh, overseas Chinese community in Southeast Asia, and which Taiwan initially uh, managed to do so for the past uh, few years under the NSPT, and we have seen the Indonesian uh, uh, students have been going up. Uh, to uh, the, the number of Indonesian students studying in Taiwan have been rising. We also seen from this vocational seventy vocational programs that uh, Taiwan. Uh, signed with Vietnam just for vocation programs and for one particular country and, and there's Vietnam and then Taiwan signed as much as 70 vocational programs if encompassing uh, different sectors and uh, basically all of these Vietnamese uh, students are will be sent to Taiwan to receive training some even uh, maybe even studies there uh, yeah just uh, maybe uh, about the vocational technical uh, programs so uh, so I can see that the, the whole thing is that to, to answer your question, you uh, know, collectively. So uh, is uh, uh, Taiwan did manage to uh, get a lot uh, get a lot of a uh, goodwill, but the, the goodwill itself is confined. 
um, largely to those people uh, in the, especially in for overseas Chinese community where there's a lot, there's a, the population is a lot in Southeast Asia, but now it's going, they are, they are making waves in other, venturing into other sectors. They are the, the, the Vietnamese students, they are not even Chinese. And the Indonesian students, they are not even of Chinese origin that are studying in Taiwan. But this, uh, so, so far the, the, mix, the picture on the ground is quite mixed, yeah. Maybe my yeah. yeah, and maybe um, I can add, um, yeah, um, at the beginning stage or, or at the moment, maybe we can see that um, Taiwan is, you know, uh, putting up a lot more effort comparing to ASEAN. They are like uh, giving up scholarship and stuff like that. But um, this is a process that I think the Taiwanese government has to go through because um, to project yourself, your soft power abroad, um, you have to have enough capital to back it up. And um, at the part of ASEAN, we also believe that this is actually a two-way street, right? We, we, we don't really agree on this um, purely donor-recipient relations because uh, we believe that for long-term cooperation, we have to transform this kind of uh, relationship into a more comprehensive one. So um, for instance, yeah, a lot of Southeast Asian students uh, because they got scholarship and even on their own, they, they further their studies in Taiwan. But on the other hand, we don't see that much Taiwanese students coming into ASEAN countries for you know, furthering their education. So things like that can be strengthened. Yeah, that's um, my opinion on that. I think I can also add something to that. It's more about catching them young and uh, Taiwan hasn't really come up with uh, something that's NSP uh, specific. Most of these scholarship and fellowship, they have always been there specifically for decades. But I think they're now trying to streamline these policies within the NSP framework. And now specifically, if you look at India, the focus has been to increase the number of students. Uh, now the number of students, 2,500, they want to increase it to 10,000. And now they're also having these short-term programs that are NSP focused program. So one of the recent program was to uh, invite students from the NSP countries to a university in Chinmen, that's an outlying island, and give them a short-term course on uh, cross-strait relationship, then culture, language. Of course, you can't learn the language in two months, but of course, it's a very like crash course program. So there are policies, but these policies are very short-term. And I think when we judge the NSP, we are also, it's just six years old. Now they're also trying to revamp the policy. But I totally agree, I've been advocating for a NSP focused fellowship or scholarship is specifically language because the focus is when these students come to Taiwan and when they go back, most of these students, they become a part of the government. So the idea is that they could actually influence the government policies. But I agree with Carl that it doesn't really happen and there are limitations to that. Even though there are, uh, for example, in India, all these diplomats are now coming to Taiwan to learn the language. They're not going to China. Of course, it makes difference, but it doesn't make a lot of difference. At the end of the day, it's about their respective relationship with China. Thank you. Is there anything that any of the other participants want to ask for the others? One, one question I had was how much of Taiwan's um, Southbound policy <clears throat> is aimed at the wider Chinese diaspora. I mean, does it try to engage in, in that way or does it try to avoid engaging in that way for the obvious political issues in Southeast Asia? Maybe I, I start again with the, with the answer. So yeah, uh, from, uh, from my analysis, I can see that uh, uh, South, new Southbound policy is a expanded version of uh, just purely relying on the, let's say, Chinese diaspora in, uh, let's say, for example, the Southeast Asia. Yeah. So uh, definitely it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's trying, to, uh, Taiwan is trying to venture into the new horizons and definitely not going to, they are not going to just rely on the, uh, on the Chinese, uh, uh, on the overseas Chinese to, uh, to make sure that all these uh, programs or projects uh, are able to take uh, place in their countries. So uh, the whole thing is that, uh, I say the, but the thing is when, when it comes to the ground, 
uh, and this is uh, featured in my upcoming book on book, uh, Taiwan and Southeast Asia, yeah, soft power and hard truth. So that uh, the thing when it comes to uh, implementation on the ground, Taiwan has to rely first on the local Chinese diaspora or the Chinese diaspora to start the projects, and then from there on, they also try to uh, find or uh, to find avenues uh, to expand their soft power beyond the Chinese community whether it's through the Chinese community association with the Chinese community themselves mm -hmm. or through uh, uh, new programs that are aimed to uh, cater to uh, the non-Chinese uh, populations of uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah. So, thank like you. To. Dr. Nuriana, yeah, um, you had your hand up. Um, I wanted to ask uh, my colleagues on the Taiwan counterpart, you see one of the things that has been an issue with Korea is that the one term limit presidency generally means that there is a, a lack of continuity or consistency in the uh, policies that South Korea has put out, even though, of course, the, the acts themselves uh, continue from engagement wise, but the, the packaging of the policy does change. The Taiwan does have a two term limit presidency, but what are the likelihood of the new Southbound policy uh, also becoming subsumed or, or left behind the way the NSP has been with the South Korean case? It sounds like one for Carl. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, this is something, this is a question that I've been wondering uh, a lot. So uh, as you can see from my table there, the, so the so, um, this is so the, uh, from the past administrations, uh, the go south policy has been uh, has been uh, uh, I mean largely I mean I'll say uh, limited to certain successes within a certain uh, particular community especially and then there is a largely uh, not effective in inducing the Southeast Asian uh, let's say the populations uh, to understand Taiwan to know more about Taiwan to have a positive perception of Taiwan even to uh, uh, even to be, uh, uh, even to uh, let's say, uh, to search for Taiwan in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, new cooperation areas, is definitely you can see. That I I can see that if the DPP government is no longer in the in power, well, I think the NSPT itself may either uh, being uh, reformed or will just uh, uh, become another. Uh, become another form of a policy, just like um, uh, on policy, just like what my did. I uh, mean, uh, 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 just like what my did when he came to power after the Chen Shui Bing administration. So it's, there's no guarantee. I would say it's hard to answer that question. But I think my my colleagues, uh, Sena, will have more uh, uh, comments on this. Uh, I agree with you. I think it's a, there's a simple answer to that. If KMT comes back to power, uh, they're not going to be as active, proactive with the NSP as DPP is, and specifically this is Sang Wen's uh, Fed Foreign Policy Initiative. And we have already seen in the past when uh, Ma Chiu came to power, one of the first things he did was to shelve the Go South policy. Of course, uh, in Taiwan, they say that the new suburban policy is different from the previous versions of the Go South, pol Go South policy. Uh, but I think uh, even if we talk about KMT's foreign policy uh, when they come back to power, if and when they come back to power, I don't think it's very easy for them to just shelf whatever DPP has been doing. Of course, the focus will be on uh, managing cross rate ties, but going back to 1992 consensus is also not easy. You look at changing Taiwanese identity, specifically in the past five years, now more and more people identify themselves as Taiwanese. It was very different at least six, seven years back. And Taiwan, no matter what, it's still a democracy. There are still elections. So I think uh, going, uh, getting away from uh, uh, new suburban policy and not looking at countries such as uh, Central and Eastern European countries, India, Australia, it's not going to be easy for KMT. And to tell the people that, you know, what we have to do is to focus on China now. So I think the Myung Chio policy is not going to be in practice if KMT comes back to power in 2024. I don't think that it's going to happen in 2024. But of course, Taiwan politics is very uh, tricky. Anything can happen. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, the focus on at the elevating ties with the new suburban policies, countries would definitely be there. Great. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so, Georgian? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Bill. Uh, I was just wondering, because given that we are talking about soft power, 
Um, and, and the key component of that is telling a coherent story or a unique story about who you are and what do you want to become and what are you offering to the world? I mean, uh, from, uh, on the Korean case, I mean, you see the Koreans have tried to build a story of their developmental transformation uh, or the economic transformation and trying to project a Korean model to some extent, well, uh, to some extent, uh, well, it varies with the governments, but they're trying to build a narrative about a Korean model and its transformation. I was just wondering about uh, whether the new Southern uh, southern bound policy has something of that kind of a narrative uh, about uh, what is that uniqueness about Taiwan or, or does it build on its developmental transformation for that matter? Thank you. Well, let me answer again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Georgie, for your question. Yeah, the whole thing, there are two, I can say, over generally speaking, there are two parts of a new southern policy. The two main parts, one is the showcase what Taiwan uh, is uh, successful in terms of uh, success, uh, the success of Taiwan and success uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, manufacturing sector. The, uh, these uh, even sometimes uh, have this uh, civil society. So, so the thing is, this, this, uh, this is the part that uh, Taiwan wants to showcase to, to the world, that they are successful in their own ways, of course. And then the second part is that it's even more, it's even more uh, attractive to say, they are coming up with a future value, what Taiwan can do for you, for the subbound, new subbound policies, uh, new subbound policy countries uh, in the future. So that's why they come in with this uh, future value uh, for everyone. They say what Taiwan can do, for example, the food production zones, the regional food production zones. So they are thinking that uh, they can do, they can let's say establish a different several or even two or three, something like that, uh, uh, Food production zones in Southeast Asian countries. So, so the Southeast Asian countries will not be able, will, will not be uh, suffering or even to say having the problem with the food security when it comes to the uh, cessation or even the dis disruption, I would say, or rather or the better word, disruption of supply chain of, uh, say, food exports or uh, food imports. So, this is the thing that they are trying to do. It's like they are trying to create this uh, future, what Taiwan can do. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's like uh, the uh, Taiwanese government like to say Taiwan can help, what Taiwan can do for uh, the NSPT partners. So this is the, something, the futuristic uh, view of this, this other futuristic, futuristic uh, part of this uh, NSPT. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Shahada, did you have your hand up at one point? Sorry, I think I might have cut across you at one point. Yeah, sorry. So I thought I, I thought you were about to say ah. something. I cut across and I went to somebody else just a moment ago. So sorry about that. I uh, um I was just uh wanted to comment on. I think it was about the question whether Taiwan was only giving. I think it was around that point. Uh, I think it's yeah. a question about um whether or not they are focusing on Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia rather than other ethnic groups. Um, yeah, I agree with what uh, Dr. Carl mentioned just now. They have to start with local Chinese ethnic group because um, they have this sense of belonging. This uh, share or speak the same language, you know, Mandarin, uh, and even some in Malaysia and other part of Southeast Asia, we speak Minnan, which is uh, something like Hokkien dialect. And then uh, we also share similar culture. So it's uh, the best way to start is to start with the local Chinese diaspora. But for long term, they will need to expand it to cover other ethnic groups as well. And um, China also realized this. And um, you know, the Chinese government has been really active to promote their own governance in Southeast Asia. So uh, Xi Jinping, or the Chinese government actually produced or published this book called the Xi Jinping Governance. And they translated in Malay just to get more Malay audience in Malaysia. But um, because the way they do it is very unattractive because I don't think um, general public in Malaysia, they will have this high interest to know how Chinese govern the, the country and stuff like that. So um, if Taiwan is doing the same thing, like um, just now Chi Dong say what Taiwan can do for the others, they have to be really careful in how they project the whole thing. They can't be overdoing it. So um, like the Korean, how they can be so successful in terms of their K-drama, K-series, it's not always about how Korea successfully, you know, emerged as a middle power, but it's something more fun. Uh, stories about zombies, 
you know, story about <laughs> uh, with gruesome content and stuff like that about narcotics, but this can actually gauge uh, people's attention. So I think Taiwan can do that as well to enhance its soft power abroad. Yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Any last points from anybody or shall I shall we move towards a close? Maybe I ask, uh, maybe I add something here. So it's mm -hmm. just uh, to take on uh, uh, from Shahada's uh, point of view there. Yeah. Uh, for example, Taiwan's, uh, 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 this halal tourism in uh, several uh, in three countries. I say they are, they are, they are targeting three countries for it, uh, to uh, to open up halal tourism for Taiwan. It's uh, the the campaign itself called Salam Taiwan, which is which is quite successful thus far until COVID uh, uh, struck, uh, struck the region. So uh, this is the case where uh, the utilization of uh, let's say. Uh, of local elements into Taiwan's uh, soft power resources. For example, if you have, you have, they need to have this foreign tourism policy, uh, giving uh, free visas for uh, for the Southeast Asians to come to come to Taiwan to visit, and then of course you while giving visa, you also need uh, a local artist of uh, let's say Malay descent who will come out and to promote Taiwan among the Malay community here. So this is uh, the uh, this is. This, the whole campaign itself is quite successful. Even until today, when, when COVID when they started, started to uh, reopen the border itself. So uh, you see there are a lot more like um, Malay Muslims of Malaysia, and then they're trying to, uh, to come in, coming to this, uh, um, coming to this uh, event to get uh, uh, better tickets, uh, to get uh, best deals, and then uh, because of their perception about, about Taiwan from, uh, from the Malay artists' uh, uh, advertisements. So they, they, come, uh, they basically, it, the whole program, the whole campaign itself is, is quite successful uh, uh, when, uh, when it comes to tapping into the non-Chinese population in Malaysia. And they're trying to replicate it to Brunei and Indonesia, which they targeted two of these countries as the exports, as the, not the export, sorry, to, as the markets of, uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, future tourism. So, so this is something that uh, yeah, we should uh, take a leaf on and uh, the whole story is much more complicated on the ground, yeah. Great, thank you, that sounds, that sounds very interesting. And so I think we've kind of, it's quite, what we've done today, I think we've kind of pulled out some of these comparisons between these, these two agendas here from the, the two rival governments, well, what, what? partnering governments and I guess that's the point is that they they have quite a few things in common but they all they're also competitors slightly as well um, and have different approaches and obviously Korea has the advantage of having formal diplomatic relations with its partners whereas Taiwan has to be more creative and involve civil society and, and all the rest of it um, both senses kind of being driven by concerns about China but maybe not in exactly the same way um, and both also kind of working you know in partnership with other players as well the us japan the european union the uk in, in thinking about uh, how you know economic trade supply chains diplomatic relations and things uh, may evolve in the coming future so thanks to all of you uh, for, for taking part today i'm going to ask you to, to stay online and we might have a little private chat about some of the mechanics of where we go forward in terms of turning these presentations into papers, uh, into articles uh, for the journal. Um, it's been really well organized. Thanks very much, Carl, for bringing everyone together and for getting such uh, good and um, uh, you know, kind of apposite uh, presentations. That's great. Is there anything you want to say just at the end before we close it to the, to the public? Oh, let me say thanks to RSAA and also Bill for the, the, the your invaluable support.